Hello friends. This is the Ani Fanfix. How are you all? So we are back with an amazing movie on, what if Naruto's was master of voodoo arts? Here's a summary. Needing an edge in the shinobi world, Naruto chooses to engage in the practice of the voodoo arts. What will happen to the shinobi nations now that the child of prophecy will become a master of the dark arts and has friends on the other side? Regardless of what may transpire. But before we begin, be sure to subscribe to our channel and like this video. Now let's begin. In the apartment of one Naruto Uzumaki, the Jinchuriki was shivering from the bitter cold due to the fact that air conditioning wasn't working properly, again. He could almost swear that his landlord switched off the gas just to let him suffer from the cold. The blonde sneezed a bit and considered crashing at his friend Anko's place for a few days. She always welcomed him with open arms and was always kind to him. Hell she even trusted him to watch over her apartment whenever she went on a mission that took her outside the village. However, he shook his head negatively, not wanting to take advantage of his friend's generosity and kindness. Plus there were a few major benefits to his apartment, no one else lived in this complex, he never got visitors and thus he had complete privacy for his experiments. For some time now, he had always been struggling in the academy, though certainly not from a lack of effort. He had two major stumbling blocks that he had yet to overcome, first and foremost was the academy clone jutsu which had resulted in two failing years. And regardless of how much practice he put into it, he could never pull it off. It didn't matter how much or how little chakra he put into it, it always failed. Even the tiniest bit of chakra overloaded it. He had done all the research and knew that the jutsu failed because he was overloading it, though it wasn't necessarily due to a lack of chakra control. More like his chakra reserves were so massive that it was virtually impossible for him to properly use such a basic technique. He had attempted to ask Haruka if he could learn a higher ranked iteration of the clone jutsu, but his teacher dismissed him claiming he wasn't trying hard enough, and you'll get it with practice. Bastard, he knew exactly what the problem was and he wasn't doing anything about it. The second obstacle was that he lacked an edge. Many students had some special skill or talent mainly the clan-related students who either had clan-related jutsu or techniques, or a bloodline. Sasuke Uchiha being a prime example since he had a number of fire techniques under his belt and his clan taijutsu that gave him a clear advantage in class spars. Naruto however had no such gifts or advantages, so he tried to find one, aside from the Kyubi of course. He didn't want to rely on a singular source of power. Not to mention he wasn't yet ready to strike a deal with the biju nor was he certain what to expect when he met it. Truthfully, he was a bit apprehensive about meeting the being that was supposedly and indirectly responsible for his lonely childhood. At any rate, he did indeed find a viable power that could give him an edge, magic. Not just any kind of magic, voodoo magic. While it could be argued that ninjutsu was, in itself a form of magic. Voodoo magic has numerous uses such as accessing supernatural powers that can affect your daily life. In short, it can manipulate your luck, allowing things like money, love, success, revenge and so forth to become easily attainable. And most obviously it allowed for powers of necromancy which is what voodoo is capable of, and perhaps most famously the usage of voodoo dolls that can be used to manipulate another human being. In fact, voodoo had a pretty broad range of abilities that most people weren't aware of, and with proper practice and research, it would obviously give him the edge he needed to succeed. But there was a catch, most voodoo practitioners would have to deal with the loa, spirits or gods that can provide the needed power to a voodoo user, usually one would have to make a bargain with the loa. But if one's will is strong enough, it could be very well possible to subjugate them and make them serve you, although this wouldn't be recommended for the careless or foolhardy. And even less so for first timers like himself. He knew he needed to summon a loa to learn the deeper secrets of voodoo since there was only so much that books could teach and show him and since there weren't any practitioners of the arts in Konoha, or possibly even the shinobi nations, barring the occasional jishinist that used voodoo-like rituals, he would need to learn directly from the source. He had an array of masks set up to provide the loa a medium to communicate with, he wasn't about to let them fully materialize in the human world after all in case things went awry. After all, some loa were more violent than others depending on the type. With his preparations complete, the blonde muttered a small chant as he performed his ritual. Once he had finished chanting, the masks suddenly began to rattle and shake on the floor as they came to life and then floated in the air. 
The eye holes of the mask lit up with dull purple colored lights, and they began to move their mouths experimentally, as if testing the medium for a moment to get their bearings. The masks turned towards a large horned mask that had placed itself in the center, as if silently asking it for guidance. The horned mask seemed to be watching the blonde, almost as if silently inquiring why he had summoned them to the plane of mortals. Clearing his throat, Naruto began to speak, Greetings. I am called Naruto Uzumaki, and I thank you for responding to my summons. He then presented each of the masks some offerings to help appease them, ranging from cigars, alcohol, sweets and so forth. The Loa masks smiled and were greatly pleased by the gesture and his polite tone, remembering that previous encounters with humans that tried to bind them forcefully, it didn't end well when the Loa broke free. They then nodded to the boy, as if silently asking him what he wanted, he quickly sensed their intent and spoke, I'll try to keep this short, I require your powers and teachings of the voodoo arts. This village we are in has greatly wronged me and others that I cherish, and I intend to get payback on every last person that has crossed me and or those I love. In exchange for your services, I shall give you the souls of those very people and believe me, there is no shortage of corrupt souls in this rotten village. When he had finished speaking, the Loa became curious and seemingly sniffed at the air, and were surprised to see that he wasn't exaggerating. They could smell and sense thousands upon thousands of souls mired in corruption, greed, envy, hatred, and bigotry. This place wasn't just a banquet, it was a literal all-you-can-eat buffet for them. More importantly, they could easily sense the raw power coming off their summoner in waves, with him as their proxy, they would be full to bursting from consuming so many human souls. They gave an almost feral series of grins and happily agreed to his deal. The Loa's leader opened its mouth wide and presented the boy a top hat, a black and red tail coat, black pants, a purple sash belt, and a cane with the head being decorated with a silver serpent with jade eyes. He guessed that the outfit was based off of Baron Samadhi, sometimes known as the Gravedigger, a very powerful and significant Loa. Naruto picked up the cane and gave it a small twist, and found that it had a sword hidden inside. He remembered reading that it was possible to strengthen your connection to the Loa if you dressed and acted like them. He quickly put on the clothes and placed the top hat on his head, the Loa looked him over and nodded approvingly to his new attire. With their bargain struck, Naruto immediately dedicated himself to learning the finer arts of voodoo magic, beginning with the creation of the infamous voodoo dolls. He would need to fully understand and be able to utilize it before the next graduation that was but a short time away. While it would be nice to publicly humiliate them, he needed to know if they had any particular skeletons in the closet that would warrant further punishment. And with the help of his new friends, it would certainly be possible to do so. A few days later, Tsubaki yawned tiredly as she had clocked out for the day, her usual day job consisting of filing completed missions. It was a pretty cozy job, but it was definitely rather boring, on the other hand it also kept her close to home. She hummed thoughtfully as she thought about her finance Mizuki, knowing full well that he was involved in shady dealings. She felt deeply conflicted, she loved him and hoped he wouldn't go through with it, but at the same time, she was a kunoichi of Konoha and had an obligation to report him. But she couldn't bring herself to do it, she couldn't betray him like that. Her thoughts were interrupted when her nose caught the scent of something absolutely delicious, by Kami. Whatever it was, the scent was utterly divine. So much so her stomach began to roar angrily at her, demanding to fill it with whatever was creating that mouth-watering smell. She followed the tantalizing scent into a small bar and found it to be surprisingly empty save for the lone occupant minding the bar who was busy cleaning shot glasses while a pot of gumbo was simmering behind him in the kitchen area. At first, she didn't recognize him, and then remembered that he could only be Naruto Uzumaki. There was after all, only a single person in Konoha with blonde hair and highly distinctive whisker-like birth markings. Was he working here part-time or something? She shrugged as her belly growled some more and she took a seat at the bar and gave it a gentle knock to alert him that she was there. He looked up and smiled at her before speaking in a charming voice, Evening ma'am. How might I serve you tonight? She had to admit, he certainly had the attitude to be in the service industry, that easy smile he was giving almost instantly put her at ease, I'll take some of that gumbo you're cooking, and you think you can make a sazeric. She requested, prompting the blonde to tip his hat and began mixing her drink together with practiced ease. Anything for a lady. You're Tsubaki-san right? Mizuki's girlfriend. I've heard him mention you, but he failed to describe just how lovely you are. The whiskered teen spoke with a wink as he served her the alcoholic beverage she requested, 
she couldn't help but giggle a bit, finding it cute that a teen was flirting with her and she had to admit, it felt nice to be appreciated. And you're Naruto Uzumaki. Mizuki mentioned that you were trouble. He never said you were also a shameless flirt. He also described a certain hideous orange getup. She teased and took a sip of her drink, her response making him chuckle a bit as he grabbed a ladle and served her a large bowl of gumbo. Guilty as charged on both counts. And that part about my old getup is most unfortunately true, but lately, I think I'm rocking a new style as you can clearly see. Now why's a lovely flower like you all alone right now? He asked as he continued to clean the glasses, the Chunin woman sighed a bit as she drank more of her booze, hoping to numb the dull ache in her chest. Just got off work, been on the outs with Mizuki after I learned he's been in talks with Orochimaru to steal the Forbidden Scroll. She responded bitterly, and then her face froze in shock upon realizing the exact words that just left her mouth. Why did I just say that? She asked more to herself, wondering why she just blabbed her big secret without even thinking. Naruto chuckled a bit since he had slipped a little something in her Sazeric to loosen her tongue. He then held up an open palm and blew some kind of dust in her face, she was about to shout at him in anger but was quickly overcome by a sense of sleepiness and slumped over on the bar in a blissful slumber as she snored quietly. The Jinchuriki smirked a bit as he snapped his fingers, causing the bar to fade away and change into a rundown and rotten version of itself. Ever since he had begun learning voodoo, he had been keeping close tabs on his teachers. Uruka, unsurprisingly was entirely motivated by the loss of his parents hence his bigoted hatred towards him, but more interestingly was the fact he seemed to be showing unusual amounts of favor to Sasuke Uchiha, after using a little magic and some investigation into his bank accounts, it would seem that someone had been paying Uruka every month, bribing him no doubt. When he went to investigate Mizuki's apartment, the place was surprisingly clean, too clean in fact, barren actually. Suggesting he was either preparing to move someplace, or make a break for it if he were up to something. The blonde decided to question Mizuki's girlfriend to see if she knew anything, and by sheer luck he had struck gold. She was fully aware of his little plot and had just confessed to it. Naruto drummed his fingers along the half-rotten bar and smirked as he got an idea and a plan came to mind. His new benefactors, the Loas were surprisingly patient teachers, or perhaps his diligent studies and promise for souls afforded him their patience, but thanks to prior studies of certain magical arts, he already had a grasp for the basics. But with the Loa's teachings, he could finally and truly utilize voodoo magic, and he was going to start using it to repay the kindness of an old friend. A short while later, Oi, Anko, open up, Naruto shouted as he banged on the apartment door of his fellow pariah, a large burlap sack currently slung over his shoulders as he waited for his dear friend to open her door. Fortunately, he didn't need to wait for very long as it opened, revealing her to be only wearing a bra and panties as she spoke, I knew I heard the voice of my favorite little fox. Gotta say, I love the new outfit, and what the hell's in that sack you're carrying? At her question the blonde chuckled and replied, a little something, or rather, someone who's going to help the both of us. Now, would you be so kind as to let me in so we can talk? At his words, she grinned and nodded, clearly interested in what he had to offer. She stepped aside and allowed him entry, when he entered inside, he dumped the sack to the floor unceremoniously making it thump loudly and the occupant to groan in pain. While he could have used magic to trap his victim inside a card, he hadn't yet mastered the technique and didn't wish to risk any potential evidence against Mizuki. Alright, so what are you up to and who did you kidnap? How's this guy gonna help us? The snake user asked as she kicked the sack, making the occupant give a muffled yelp. Naruto smirked as he took a seat on her couch and tipped his hat to her before replying, Our new friend here is privy to a plot to steal the Forbidden Scroll. The way I figure, we can both stand to gain something from this. You can get the credit for busting the culprit, and all I ask in return is that you accept me as your personal apprentice. The dango lover had to blink her eyes a few times to wonder if she heard him right, she then replied with a toothy grin, Naruto, if you wanted to be my apprentice, I'd have taken you regardless. But I see what you're going for, you want to give me a little leverage to make it happen. Indeed you are correct Anko-chan, a little something to grease the wheels so to speak. I know you've been stonewalled by the civilian council, claiming you're still connected to your ex-sensei. The whiskered teen spoke as he reached into his tailcoat and pulled out a voodoo doll made in the likeness of one Kazashi Haruno, 
however it was missing a critical ingredient, a piece of his essence so for now, it was utterly useless. Anko gave a small scoff and sneered angrily since it was people like that swine that kept her and her precious blonde from reaching their full potential, but it seemed like that was going to change. He then smirked and spoke, now listen close Anko Chan, I've got a plan, and I'm gonna need your help. I've got some new friends on the other side, but they can only do so much. Since you've been so good to me, I believe we can help each other out a lot, and we can start by digging ourselves out of the pits that we were cast into by those who despise us. For the next few hours they spoke, with Naruto explaining his plan in great detail that would help propel them to greater heights, and more importantly take their vengeance on everyone that wronged them. He told her of his deal with the Loa, although she seemed to take it surprisingly well since there were a great many mysteries in the shinobi world, she just hoped he hadn't bitten off more than he could chew. She promised to teach him some different clone techniques she knew to blaze through his academy exam, which was a major boon to him and even if Aruka tried to cheat him out of the exam, he was more than ready for the scarred Chunin since he had acquired a hair sample from his apartment. The blonde wanted to tell Anko he was working on a means of freeing her from the curse mark with the Loa's aid, but he didn't want to give her false hope in case it turned out to be a failure. But once he was ready, he'd give her the good news. For now, he had to focus on what was within his current reach and capabilities. It was time to make his first move. But there was one more thing he needed to do before then. Something he'd been holding off on, talking to the Kayubi. After kissing Anko goodbye and leaving Tsubaki in her care, he decided to head home to his apartment. It was time to confront the Nine Tails. Later. Mindscape. Wow. Talk about depressing. Then again, given my childhood, Naruto muttered to himself as he walked through his mindscape which was little more than a sewer, likely shaped by his lonely childhood and his feelings of isolation. However, it wasn't long until he came upon what he believed he was looking for. A large set of gates with the kanji for, seal, placed upon them. If nothing else, he at least hoped to get some answers from the biju about that fateful night. He approached the gates and could hear the sounds of loud snoring inside, but then it suddenly stopped as a row of sharp teeth and burning crimson eyes appeared from within the dark confines of the cage. I've been waiting for you, Naruto Uzumaki. I see you made a deal with the Loa. Most impressive. Would you perhaps be here to cut a deal with me? The biju spoke with a chuckle, obviously unsurprised by his presence and was undoubtedly aware of everything he saw and did, no surprise since it lived inside his head. I might be. I need free access and training in the usage of your chakra and anything else you might know that could help me. Along with any information you may have about the night of my birth. Now, what do you want in exchange? Naruto asked cautiously, not knowing what the biju may ask for in exchange. At first he was met by silence and then he saw the Kyubi's large form shrink down rapidly until it was human-sized and it approached the gates. He let out a long whistle showing how impressed he was by her human form. She had vibrant crimson hair, caramel-colored skin, a highly curvaceous body with a set of breasts that could rival the slug Sanim, long luscious legs, ruby red eyes and whisker markings on her cheeks and nine fluffy fox tails coming from her rear. Simply put, I want out. I am tired of being tucked away like a toy in a chest. I want to feel the sun on my face, the wind in my hair, the ability to eat and drink food and booze again, to enjoy the small things. That's a fairly tall order. He spoke suspiciously as he glanced up at the seal but guessed that she herself couldn't actually remove it on her own, otherwise she would have done so already. She giggled a bit and booped him on the nose before speaking. Now don't fret my dear. I wouldn't dream of harming a hair on your little head. I hold no grudge against you, it isn't your fault that we're stuck in our current predicament, and I'm sure you and your new allies can find a way to slip me out and around this seal while maintaining our connection. He raised an eyebrow and found her words a little too good to be true. Sensing his doubt the Kitsune spoke, Okay, okay. How about a token of good faith? Any questions you have about your parents or the night of my rampage, I'll answer for you, no strings attached. You deserve that much at least. The Jinchuriki was rather tempted by that prospect, although he found it a bit unusual that she was being so cooperative. He was expecting some angry and cranky Kitsune that would constantly threaten him or try to undermine him and his beliefs. You could lie, Kitsunes are known to be tricksters. He pointed out while crossing his arms over his chest, his words earning a playful smile from her. Trickster, sure, I'll give you that. But I'm not a liar. But we're also known to be guides and faithful companions. 
and I won't just tell you, I'll show you. She replied and extended a tail to him, swaying it invitingly. The blonde could no longer ignore the temptation since the answers he sought were within reach, and he didn't sense any deception from the bijou. He took her tail in his hand and his mind was flooded with memories about his parents, his lost clan, and the night of the Kyubi's rampage. He saw the man in the mask, the Sheringdon user, it was all his fault. It was because of him that Naruto's parents died, that he had to be the scapegoat for the villagers' grudge, why everyone treated him like a leper. Everything bad that happened from him, was because of this man. Naruto was tempted to throw this man to the Loa, but death would be too great a kindness for him. No, he'd be sure to give the Sheringdon user a new definition of suffering. Karama right? Naruto asked, remembering her name from the memories she showed and then continued, any idea who the man in the mask was? Not many Uchihas had the power to subjugate you with their Sharingan. He pointed out at the end since, according to history, Madara was supposedly the only Uchiha that was capable of such a feat. If I knew, I'd most certainly tell you so you can rip him to pieces. But I can say he wasn't Madara. His chakra didn't feel or smell the same to me. Kurama replied with a frustrated sigh. She desperately wanted to eat that damned man in the mask, but then she thought against it since the last time she ate some humans it didn't turn out that well for her. I see, still to think that my parents were the Yondaimi Hokage and your previous host, then again that makes way more sense on why it had to be me. And I can imagine they would have had a lot of enemies inside and outside of Konoha, hence why my lineage was kept secret, even from me. Less risk of exposure that way in case I blabbed to the wrong people. The blonde muttered quietly to himself since things now made much more sense to him. He wanted to confront the Sandame about it, but first and foremost he needed to determine who was and wasn't trustworthy before anything else. One wrong move and it could be lights out. The shinobi world was an extremely cutthroat one after all. He smiled at the kitsune and spoke, I certainly appreciate your candor. I'm sure I can find a means to accommodate you in the future, so please be patient until then. Kurama shrugged her shoulders and replied in a sarcastic manner, I've nowhere else to be. Just don't take too long, I'm K. He nodded in agreement and snapped his fingers, causing the sewer-like mindscape to change into a field of wildflowers, trees, soft grass and hills while the seal itself changed and took on the form of a choker around her neck. In the meantime, I hope a change of scenery will be sufficient. Be seeing you. The whiskered teen spoke and tipped his hat before vanishing away, leaving the bijou to happily sigh as she resumed her natural bijou form and enjoyed her new surroundings which were much more comfortable than the cold and depressing sewers. She was definitely looking forward to working with this one. The next day, okay now, today's the day, I gotta make sure I got this right, Naruto muttered to himself as he walked towards his classroom, for tomorrow was the academy exams, and today was his last chance to fine-tune his voodoo doll magic and make sure it was working properly. He wasn't going to leave anything to chance. Acquiring a hair sample from Aruka's apartment was a simple manner, he just needed to open a window and pluck one from his pillow. He would need to sneak into the Haruno residence sometime or other to collect hair samples from them. Chiefly Kazashi and his little brat, Sakura who both seemed like they were out to get him. Though in Sakura's case it seemed more like she was trying to use him as her human stress ball due to her failings with Sasuke. And from the memories Kurama showed, Kazashi was an old enemy of his mother since she got him kicked out of the shinobi corps. On to other matters, later today, he had a private lesson with Anko, he was sure he could learn any clone techniques she had to show him in no time at all so that was covered. Voodoo magic wasn't as exact in nature as ninjutsu techniques to be honest. He entered his classroom and found that a large number of the seats had yet to be occupied, which gave him plenty of places to choose from. He took a seat far in the back and discreetly pulled out a doll made in Aruka's likeness. While it wasn't a necessity to make the dolls bear the resemblance of the intended target, a more detailed and accurate representation made the magic and connection between both doll and victim significantly stronger and easier to control. He would only use a plain straw doll for emergency purposes, such as a lack of time for instance. He couldn't help but smirk as he saw both Chunin enter the classroom, he couldn't hear what they were saying but from what he could read from their lips it seemed they were chatting about potential team assignments and something was mentioned about the reformation of the Ino Shika Cho team. He smirked a bit wider as he quietly muttered an incantation and activated Aruka's doll. 
he gave it a quick tap on the shoulder, making the Chunin jump a bit as he turned around to see who had touched him but found nothing there. The scarred man seemed confused but then shrugged and resumed talking to his partner like nothing happened. Deciding to get a bit bolder and wanting to invoke a stronger reaction from the Chunin he pinched the doll's cheek hard making the Chunin yell out in pain which surprised his partner at the sudden outburst. Uh, you okay there Aruka? Mizuki asked as he scratched the top of his head, his longtime partner seemed to be unusually jumpy today for some reason. Did he drink too much coffee or something this morning? The scarred teacher rubbed his sore cheek tenderly and replied, sorry about that. Felt like something was pinching me, I could almost swear it was like something was, is it getting hot in here? He asked at the end as he began to sweat profusely, his face starting to become flushed as if he had a fever. Unknown to them, Naruto was holding a lighter to the voodoo doll's face, far enough away to avoid burning it, but definitely close enough for Aruka to feel the heat. Naruto had to stifle his laughter, he was actually enjoying messing with the chunin and then decided for a little public humiliation as he saw a number of students starting to file inside. Geez Aruka, your face is all red like a tomato. You sure you're okay? Mizuki asked, not that he actually cared, but he still had to maintain his facade until his planned theft. Sensing an opportunity, Naruto began to whisper something to the doll, which caused Aruka to speak, I'm sorry Mizuki, but I can't contain my passion for you any longer. At his words, the students froze up while in the process of taking their seats as they all turned to the teachers. The white-haired man's only response was a confused, Bawa? Yes. I love you Mizuki. You have always been at my side for every year as we looked after these snot-nosed brats, like that arrogant needle dick Sasuke or that washboard howler monkey Haruno who is only here to get Sasuke's money like all those other nameless fangirls. The scarred teacher spoke, which earned him some very nasty looks from all of the students. Most especially the fangirls, Sakura, and of course Sasuke. Um, Aruka? You may want to put a filter on yourself. And, if you're into that kinda thing, well, that's your business but I'm not into guys. Mizuki muttered uncomfortably since he had never been confessed to by another man and he certainly would never have expected it from his partner, but then had he ever actually dated a woman before? He couldn't remember. Having seen enough, Naruto whispered his incantation and shut off the flow of magic within the voodoo doll, rendering it inert for the time being. With Aruka's motor control now back to normal, he stammered uncontrollably, trying to explain himself but he couldn't find the proper words except that he had no idea what came over him, which likely would have made it worse. Can we just put this aside now? We do have a class to teach. Mizuki pointed out, silencing his partner who could only nod, feeling utterly humiliated by what just transpired. And even worse, the entire class seemed ready to tear him to pieces for being called snot nosed brats. The Jinchuriki felt confident that his voodoo doll magic was working perfectly. His long hours of study and late night practice and experimentation was paying off in full. He had started out trying it on animals and random civilians but he needed to be sure if it would have the same potency on a shinobi in case they could somehow break free. That didn't seem to be the case in this instance, especially he was unaware of the influence over his body. But would it have the same effect over a shinobi that was aware of the doll's influence? He was certainly looking forward to finding out, but that was enough musing for now. He had to focus on making it through the academy. After today, Anko would teach him the clone iterations she knew so that was something to look forward to. He wasn't going to fail a third year, not a chance in hell. And if Aruka tried to pull something, he'd have an accident. Class went as per normal, except Aruka seemed to be fumbling through his usual history lecture as he withered under the nasty looks he was getting from the students. Barely ten minutes in, Mizuki decided to intercede to spare his partner and himself from further embarrassment and took over the lecture himself. After a few more minutes into the lecture, Naruto took notice that the classroom door was open slightly, and then an object was thrown into the class. A smoke bomb went off and the sounds of glass shattering and rapid footsteps could be heard with shouts of, Go Go Go! Followed by the sounds of blows landing and screams of pain. When the smoke cleared, Mizuki was face first on the floor and multiple Anbu having their blades trained on him, all aimed at his vital areas. And standing over him was the form of Anko who had a bound and gagged Tsubaki in tow. Mizuki, you're under arrest for colluding with Orochimaru and plotting to steal the Forbidden Scroll. Your girlfriend told us everything. The Dango lover spoke with a cheeky grin, 
and before the white-haired man could even speak out, a gag was crammed into his mouth and a black bag placed over his head. The Anbu beat him some more with steel batons and kicking him, before placing the chakra ceiling cuffs on him and dragging him out the door. Class is cancelled for the day, Enko announced, sending a flirty wink to her favorite blonde who tipped his hat to her. He was looking forward to training under her soon. Now that his experiment was a success and with her teaching, he was sure to pass this year. Everything was going according to his plans. But before that, now was a good time to get some samples from some annoyances in his life. Well, that was quite the display. A. Eh? Naruto spoke as he came up behind Sakura and managed to snatch a strand of her distinctive pink hair from her clothes which came off easily due to its length. The Haruno absentmindedly nodded in surprise since she was still processing what happened. And now there's only one teacher left to cater to you, Hasasuke. Think this might mess with the academy exam. But then, being the golden boy of the academy and all, you don't really need to train or study since you'll be passed regardless of your performance. Naruto spoke to the self-proclaimed Avenger who angrily glared at the blonde and got up in his face. You'd better watch your mouth, Dobi. It's not wise to mess with an Uchiha elite. Sasuke muttered, feeling insulted that the blonde was insinuating that he couldn't pass without help from the teachers, make that teacher now. Singular. Point one out to me and I'll be sure to keep that in mind. The Uzumaki spoke in a snarky tone, and managed to snip off a bit of the Uchiha's hair while he was distracted knowing full well that Sasuke had a multitude of weaknesses, chiefly his own arrogance and apparent inability to see past his nose. Figuratively speaking, you might have a new get-up and a fancy devil-may-care attitude, but you'll still be nothing but a clanless loser and an orphan. The Uchiha spit back, the blonde's attitude getting on his nerves. If the little brat weren't so close with the sandame, he would have slugged the dobi by now. Guess that makes two of us, at least you had something to lose. Naruto replied with a shrug, finding it deeply insulting that Sasuke had the chance to have a family and he wasn't even appreciative for that simple fact. It was a major reason why the blonde never liked the Uchiha prick. He then blew some kind of powder in Sasuke's face making the Uchiha sputter and cough as the Uzumaki walked away, as he made his way out of the classroom, the Uchiha's face began to swell up and itch horribly as he scratched away at it to ease the itching sensation. Some screams could be heard as the fangirls got a good look at the Uchiha's now swollen face making Naruto laugh. He was definitely enjoying the new powers and opportunities his voodoo magic provided him. By now, Anko was likely giving her report to the Hokage, so he decided to wait for her in the good news. In the Hokage's office, and so, thanks to a reliable source that provided me Tsubaki and the intel, with Tsubaki herself confirming it, we were able to quickly arrest Mizuki with no major incident. Mizuki himself is currently being escorted to the T&I division where both Ibiki and Inoichi will work him over and question him for information, and then mind scan him for confirmation. Enko spoke, giving her final report to the Sandame who nodded appreciatively. He hadn't expected that Orochimaru would have enlisted a rank and file Chunin, an academy teacher no less to steal such an important artifact like the Forbidden Scroll, or maybe it was precisely because he wouldn't have expected that his ex-student planned this out. The snake Sanin had a way of getting into people's heads and was as slippery as they came which is what made him so dangerous, even before he reduced his existence to that of a parasite. I thank you for taking the initiative and quickly thwarting this plot Anko san A suitable reward will be prepared for you shortly. He spoke in gratitude, but was surprised when she shook her head negatively. Actually, there's something else I want. I want Naruto placed under my personal tutelage. I want him as an apprentice. She spoke in a stern voice signaling that she refused to take no for an answer. Hiruzen hummed thoughtfully knowing the two pariahs were very close and would make a powerful duo. However they were also known to be highly volatile in nature and without someone to keep them in check, they ran the risk of running out of control. Not to mention it would throw off the numbers and one team would be incomplete, and there were no viable replacements. I'm afraid that isn't currently possible, but I can make you a joint sensei for a team. Should Naruto pass, He'll be assigned to Team 7, along with Sasuke Uchiha, Sakura Haruno, and your partner shall be Kakashi Hitaki. The snake user grumbled at that, while Kakashi was a competent shinobi, especially when he got serious, he had almost no prior teaching experience since he failed all other teams assigned to him. 
She guessed the only real reasons he was placed in charge of Team 7 was because he himself was a member of the previous carnation, and more likely was the only one that could teach Sasuke how to use his Sharingan when it activated. Not to mention it was plausible the two Sharingan users were likely there to potentially subdue Naruto with their Sharingan in case he tapped into the Kyuubi's powers. Additionally, putting together an Uzumaki and an Uchiha was sure to end in bloodshed. Sakura however had no connection or talents to contribute aside from her book smarts but had no practical skills to apply them, though it was possible that her father may have pulled some strings to put her on the same team as the Uchiha to increase her chances of hooking up with Sasuke, in spite of how non-existent they were. Enko grumbled and knew that she wasn't going to get a much better deal than that, and it wouldn't be wise to argue with the Hokage. One more thing, keep a close eye on Sasuke Uchiha. I don't trust Kakashi to remain entirely impartial given his past connection and guilty conscience over his fallen teammate who was also an Uchiha. Not to mention Sasuke himself is believed to be a potential flight risk. I requested that Inoichi have his daughter observe and formulate a psych profile on the Uchiha during his school year, and the results were less than promising. I strongly suspect that if your former teacher were to try and tempt Sasuke with some form of power, that he wouldn't hesitate to take it. That's where you come in. If need be, kill Sasuke should he willingly go rogue. At that, she could only nod since she now had a much better understanding of the situation. She gave a salute and left the Hokage Tower, where outside Naruto was waiting for her as he was flipping through some cards. She approached him and said, Hey Naruto-kun, whatcha doing there? She asked out of curiosity at the end. The blonde smirked as he flipped over a card and then shuffled them all back together before pocketing the deck. Was practicing my tarot reading. Divination isn't the most exact facet in the voodoo arts. But the cards told me that you have good and bad news. So, let's hear it. The blonde requested making his friend sigh as she told him everything that had been spoken between herself and the sandane. The blonde murmured in mild disappointment to the news as he flipped through his tarot cards, though he had to admit, he wasn't entirely surprised to hear about this. Traditionally, Team 7 was composed of the top student or rookie of the year, the top kunoichi of the year, and of course the dead last, the student with the lowest overall grades in the academy. And failing two prior years didn't help his case. With the teacher's favoritism and Sasuke's clan taijutsu and his fire techniques given him an unfair advantage it was no wonder he was nominated for rookie of the year. As for Sakura, the academy curriculum was almost entirely theoretical and relied on academics, which made it entirely possible for the Haruno, in spite of her nature as a fangirl to easily get by with book smarts alone. However, she wouldn't last long in the real world as a kunoichi if she didn't improve herself. If nothing else, at least I know for sure you'll be around to help keep me sane. The whiskered teen spoke, making the dango lover nod in agreement since they would still be together and since they'd be on the same team they'd be able to spend much more time with each other now. Also, now that he had hair samples from his soon-to-be teammates, he had a means of keeping control of them if they ever got out of line. Most especially Sasuke. With that bit of business closed, the two decided to head for the forest of death and assume a little pre-exam cram training. Unknown to the village of Konoha, the dark shadows of the Loa now loom, eagerly waiting for their new contractor to provide the souls he promised them, and then they heard it. They heard him whisper to them through the use of his voodoo magic. They could claim the soul of the one called Mizuki who was now in prison. It would be little more than a sample for now, but they sensed that there would be many more to come. They wondered if the female called Tsubaki would be a tasty morsel and sent a telepathic image of her as if asking if she were on the menu. The blonde denied them, claiming that she may be of further use down the line but they would be given a suitable replacement. The Loa didn't complain, there would be plenty for them to eat in due time. In the dark confines of Konoha Penitentiary, Mizuki grumbled quietly to himself as he sat in the corner of his cell, having no choice but to await his trial. At a guess, he suspected life in prison at best, or more likely execution to be his sentence since Konoha didn't take kindly to traitors. He couldn't help but wonder how someone caught on to the fact Tsubaki was aware of his plans, especially since she wouldn't have ratted on him. The woman was far too soft-hearted for her own good, but at least it made her easy for him to manipulate, allowing him to use her own feelings for him to keep her quiet about his plans. His musing was cut short when he heard something scuffling along the floor, at first he believed it to be a rat, 
but when he looked down he saw some kind of straw doll that seemed to be moving about on its own, and it wasn't alone. More dolls came scurrying out from the shadows, carrying needles, kitchen knives, scissors, scalpels and other sharp tools and instruments. Um. Guards. Anyone out there? What's with the creep show? The white-haired man called out, wondering if this was some kind of scare tactic, but he received no response from his guards. He glanced up down the hall and saw that the two chunin assigned to watch him were lying on the floor with spilled coffee mugs close by. Likely having been drugged. The dolls began chittering some strange language and pointed their weapons at him, with more dolls appearing carrying bundles of rope, wires, cables, and anything else that could be used to bind a person. Hey! Stay away from me you little gremlins! The ex chunin shouted nervously, wishing his chakra wasn't currently sealed otherwise he would have turned these dolls into a bonfire. He quickly rose to his feet and snatched up a wooden stool, the only thing in the cell he could use as a weapon that wasn't bolted down. He took a swing at the growing army of dolls, knocking a group of them away and sent them flying, this only seemed to amuse them as they began to make squeaky little giggles, almost as if they found it entertaining that he was putting up a struggle. Then they all rushed forward at once prompting the ex chunin to wildly swing the stool to try and drive them away. He sent more flying in a variety of directions, but they would only get back up and charge forward once more. Some managed to reach his legs and started to stab and slice at his ankles, making him scream in pain and his injuries forced him to his knees. Mizuki flailed about to try and keep them at bay, but a few dolls leapt up and started stabbing his arms, forcing him to drop his improvised weapon. The dolls giggled more and cackled as they climbed up his body and began to tie off lengths of rope wire and cable on his body and then began to drag him down to the floor with their combined efforts. He tried to resist but a pair of dolls slipped a noose around his neck, giving the army of dolls more leverage to pull with, and a few started stabbing him in the stomach with their needles to end his futile resistance. At last, he was pulled down to the floor, his face pressed hard against the cool concrete floor. The bindings on his limbs, neck and body were pulled taut to cut off any chance of movement and prevent him from escaping. Even if he tried, he guessed they'd start to attack him with their weapons again. From what little he could see, the dolls were now doing some kind of ritualistic chant and dance as the ones not holding the bindings were wildly moving about. They suddenly stopped, and then one dressed in a little black robe began to chitter some kind of a prayer, and then they all turned their weapons toward him. Mizuki begged and pleaded for them to spare him, but his words only served to earn more squeaky giggles. The only sounds that could be heard were Mizuki's pained screams, the cutting and tearing of flesh, and the splashing of blood. And so the Loa have now claimed but the first of many victims. The next morning. In Konoha Academy, the many students sat in their seats apprehensively as they awaited the academy exam, although some didn't seem worried in the slightest, mainly the clan heirs amongst the students. Even Naruto himself was sitting calmly as he flipped through his tarot cards to practice his abilities in divination. According to the cards, Mizuki met a gruesome end the previous night, as befitting for a traitor. Not that he needed them to inform him of that, but it was still good practice. The cards also read that he would be seeing an old friend and that his fortunes looked very good today. Naruto grinned to himself as he silently thanked Anko for her private tutelage, having trained him in both the water and mud clone techniques. With those jutsu at his disposal, there was no way he could fail unless Uruka cheated him, and even if he did so, well, that's why the blonde had his voodoo doll on hand as a backup plan. He drummed his fingers along his desk as he thought about the Kyubi's offer. All things considered her terms were quite generous since all she really wanted was some form of access to the physical world. Not to mention they seemed to have a common enemy in the masked Uchiha. He would need to consult the Loa on how to safely extract her without breaking the seal, and just as if not more importantly he would need them to shatter Anko's curse mark once and for all. He then saw Aruka enter the classroom, but he wasn't alone. It seemed he had a substitute chunin with him in the form of Hana Inazuka who was undoubtedly there to replace Mizuki due to his arrest. No better replacement could have possibly been chosen given the fact he was very familiar with her since he would occasionally volunteer to help out at the Inazuka clan's kennels. She immediately took notice of him and sent a flirty wink after noticing his new outfit prompting the Jinchuriki to tip his hat to her in thanks. Aruka gave a little speech that was of no interest to Naruto, who was currently focused on Hana which didn't go unnoticed by her. She gave him a saucy grin and wished that they were in a more private setting. Being an Inazuka meant that they were more susceptible to their baser instincts. 
and with the night of a full moon approaching she felt much like a bitch in heat that needed a male to mount her and start breeding her with his seed. Even from this distance, the strong scent coming off the blonde was enough to make her loins ache hungrily. But she had to keep it together since she was currently working. She sighed as Aruka ended his speech, wishing luck to all the students and then passed out written tests to be distributed amongst them. Naruto sighed since he felt that this test was far too simple. He was actually certain he could successfully answer them all while blindfolded. He rested his head in a loosely closed fist and quickly scribbled down the answers in less than three minutes. The blonde then blew a quiet raspberry to himself since he didn't have anything to do until the jutsu portion began. He hummed quietly to himself and wondered if divination would help uncover the identity of the masked man that was responsible for the Kyubi attack. While tarot readings and divination weren't always clear-cut or fully reliable, they could provide some reference for him to work with. And better still, it would be good practice for him. He shuffled the deck and drew three cards, the first one showed that the man in question is a phantom of a man that is long believed to be dead. The second card revealed that he was driven by a single-minded obsession and wouldn't stop at anything to achieve his desire, even if it meant the ruin of others. And the third card revealed that he had committed many atrocities and was far beyond the point of redemption, and countless souls were crying out for vengeance. He shuffled the cards back into the deck and tried again, only to achieve the same results. As expected, clear as mud, though it did give him a somewhat better understanding of his foe. The first card was the one that puzzled him, but given the memories he had experienced thanks to Kurama he doubted the term, phantom, was literal, and she did confirm that he wasn't Madara. He doubted that someone with a stolen Sharingan could utilize enough power to subjugate the Kyubi, and given the time frame, it would have to be someone that, died, before the Uchiha massacre, most likely during the previous Shinobi war. Still, Naruto was sure that a number of Uchihas died back then as well, so he'd need a bit more information to narrow the field. There were also two more matters on his mind, he was fully aware that both of his parents sealed a small piece of their souls inside the seal that kept Kurama in check as a backup plan if and when he attempted to break it. Normally, cheating death would put you on the Shinigami's blacklist, but fortunately some of the Loa were also representatives of death. With their aid, it could be possible to restore them, or at least his mother to life once more since they hadn't fully crossed over to the realm of the dead. The reason he was reluctant to resurrect his father, Minato, was largely due to the memories he received showing him choosing Jiraiya, the toad Sanin as his godfather who was suspiciously absent throughout his life. Not to mention his father's attitude prior to his death seemed to strongly suggest that he put the fate of the village ahead of his own son's well-being while his mother didn't share that same sentiment. His musing came to a close as Hannah called for students to line up for the jutsu portion of the exam. The blonde grinned to himself as he took his place in the very back of the line as he prepared to not only take his revenge on Aruka, but also isolate him for questioning. He waited a few minutes as the line slowly dwindled with each student performing the three basic academy jutsu. Honestly, this test was so easy that he strongly doubted it would truly qualify them as genin. Most likely this was a preliminary test to weed out those who couldn't make the cut. It was a requisite that one should be able to properly utilize their chakra and could use the three basic jutsu which were widely believed to be the building blocks of a shinobi's career, however Naruto always found it suspicious that Rock Lee from last year was able to pass since he couldn't properly harness his chakra like everyone else. Most likely he was given a specialized test to accommodate his handicap, letting him pass through the usage of taijutsu techniques. And yet Naruto himself was never given a fair shot at passing, because of Aruka's bigotry and grudge against him. He knew for a fact his chakra was too potent to use the basic form of the clone technique, and Aruka himself had to be aware of this but deliberately did nothing to give him a fair chance. For three years now, Aruka had power over him due to his position as an academy teacher, but now the Jinchuriki had power of his own. Naruto decided now was the time to make his move, if he got too close to the front, it would make this next course of action more difficult. Fortunately there were still plenty of students ahead of him to make a decent and incidental barricade to mask his movements. The Jinchuriki pulled out the Aruka doll and muttered an incantation to activate it, he then pulled out some ghost peppers from inside his coat and muttered another spell to make the doll's mouth open wide. One by one, he began dropping the ghost peppers into the doll's mouth and then waited. 
The scarred Chunin's face turned red as his eyes began watering and he clutched at his throat and grabbed a glass of water sitting on the teacher's desk. He drank it in several loud gulps but it wasn't enough to cool off the heat coursing through his body. So he took the entire jug full of iced water and began to do the same and chug the contents as quickly as possible while the various students and Hannah herself watched in interest and amusement, some of them giggling as they watched his face turn even redder. Naruto then muttered quietly, time to nuke your guts. The whiskered teen pulled out a funnel and placed it above the doll's mouth then poured an entire bottle's worth of cattle laxatives down the funnel and into the waiting mouth of Aruka's doll. He smirked as he waited for a few moments, and then the scarred Chunin clutched at his stomach as it began to growl loudly and the sounds of flatulence could be heard. The Chunin sweated profusely as he tried to maintain control of his bowels, but the dam was ready to burst at any moment. He screamed out an, excuse me, and charged out of the classroom at full speed to the nearest restroom down the hall before it was too late. At that, a number of students burst out in full laughter at the scene and wondered exactly how long he'd be stuck in there with some of them starting to make bets on the subject. The test continued on with Hannah evaluating the student's performance in Aruka's place. The witch doctor in training would need to make it up to her later for that. At long last, his turn came and Hannah winked at him, giving him the go-ahead and requested that he perform a henge. He snapped his fingers and in a puff of smoke changed into a perfect likeness of the sandane. She then requested he perform a substitution, and in response he replaced himself with Aruka's chair, planted a kiss on her cheek and then switched places with the chair again placing him back in his original position. Hey, quit getting all flirty with my sister, came a shout that could only belong to Kiba with the whiskered teen casually flipping the bird while the rest of the students couldn't help but giggle. Hannah shrugged her shoulders and spoke, Last Jutsu Naruto-kun. I just need you to perform any clone variation you know. At that many of the students seemed rather puzzled at her words since they were never taught, shown, or heard mention that one could use a different clone technique to pass. Hold on a second. You mean to say we don't specifically need to learn the academy taught clone jutsu? Sasuke asked with a throbbing tick mark feeling that he'd been cheated out of learning what may be a useful technique since the basic clone jutsu was a joke. The female Inazuka sweat dropped a bit since she'd requested the same of all the other students and only now did they take notice? If these kids couldn't pay attention to minor details like that, then they would be struggling as ninjas if they lacked awareness and vigilance. Um, yeah, back in the day it was pretty common for some academy students to have much stronger chakra reserves than others so they were permitted to learn higher tier variations of the clone jutsu in order to pass. Uruka never told you that or offered, did he? She asked at the end and cast a suspicious glare on Naruto, already guessing that Uruka had withheld that information from him. Naruto put a single finger to his lips making a shush gesture, and then performed two slashing motions, one across the bridge of his nose and the other across his throat. It would seem that he was already in the process of taking care of her fellow chunin and whatever came over Aruka was likely from Naruto's influence. She gave him a quick nod and decided to let the whiskered pup handle it himself, from that fiendish look in his eye, Aruka wouldn't be escaping in one piece. That was for certain. The Jinchuriki decided to move things along and performed a single hand sign causing multiple duplicates of himself to appear as he summoned water clones. Hana nodded in satisfaction and declared that Naruto passed, she gave him his headband and gave a small peck on his lips while muttering a quick congratulations. He returned the gesture with a kiss of his own and then tied off the headband to his right arm and tipped his hat to her before rejoining the crowd of students. He had to chuckle a bit as he noticed Kiba looking rather peeved at him, but he paid no attention to it. All right everyone, congrats to those who passed the academy exam. Come by tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. for team assignments. Good luck. Hannah called out though a number of the students wondered why they had been wished good luck when they'd already passed. Naruto, for his part, decided to slip away and check on his old buddy Uruka. He whistled a small tune to himself and entered the restroom, but not before slipping on a gas mask he'd borrowed from his buddy Tenten, he wasn't about to risk smelling whatever Uruka created in there. When he entered there was only one occupied stall, no surprise given whatever the occupant was going through. Smirking to himself, the blonde tapped on the locked door with his cane and spoke, Hey, sensei. How are you doing in there? Have you given birth to a ten-pound chocolate mud baby yet? There was a pained groan followed by a weak response, Naruto, you little. O-G-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-W-D. 
You did this to me. I don't know how, but I know you did this. The scarred Chunin spoke as he flushed the toilet to drain out its contents before it overflowed for the, he forgot how many times now actually. For once, I am guilty as charged. Now then, I don't suppose you can tell me who's been paying you under the table? The blonde asked as he leaned against the nearby wall across from the Chunin stall as he lazily twirled his cane around. There was a long silence from the Chunin, suggesting he was shocked and or trying to find a means to respond properly. The Jinchuriki smirked and continued, I broke into your apartment, did a little snooping to see just how dirty you were. I found your bank statements and every month, someone has been sending you money. Who is it and what for? Again, the only response he received was silence so the blonde spoke, tell me now and I'll end your suffering. Otherwise, you can just crap yourself to death. Makes no real difference to me. There was another pained groan followed by more flatulence as Aruka finally replied, Okay okay already. Uncle. It was Jiraiya. He told me to keep an eye on you and to keep you trapped in the academy. The Uzumaki hummed in thought, just what was the toad sonning up to? Why attempt to sabotage his education? Being a Jinchuriki that practically made him a walking weapon of mass destruction and the only viable means of defense against a rampaging biju or another Jinchuriki. It made very little sense to weaken him, unless it was for a different reason that required him to be weaker. So the Toad Sanin put you up to it huh? Thought you could get some revenge on me and make some extra money on the side? You disgust me. You aren't respectable enough to even be called a teacher. Here's a fun fact, they don't call you number two because you're a piece of shit. They call shits the number two because of you. Naruto spoke angrily and then tapped his cane to end Aruka's suffering as he promised. A green mist flowed into the stall and gathered around the toilet the Chunin was trapped on. Naruto then quickly departed since he didn't want to get caught up in the gory aftermath. Uruka heard the bathroom door shut, signaling that the demon brat had finally left, but his apparent relief was short-lived as the toilet began to rattle and shake under him. He yelped in surprise and hopped off the toilet, his pants stuck around his ankles as he turned around and saw the bull start growing teeth and a pair of glowing purple eyeballs appeared on top of the tank. The toilet beast stared at the Chunin and then growled angrily at him. Nice toilet. Down boy. Good boy. Uruka whimpered out in fear, and then loud screams could be heard echoing down the halls. The next day. Hokage office. Inoichi Yamanaka, could you please run that by me again once more? I want to be certain I heard you correctly. The Sandame requested, having recently received two reports back to back on the mysterious deaths of Mizuki and Aruka respectively. The former had been murdered in his cell, with numerous stab wounds and strange glyphs carved into his flesh in a ritualistic manner. The guards were unable to do anything at the time because they were drugged. And from the memories Inoichi retrieved from Mizuki's brain he had been attacked by an army of six-inch tall straw dolls. Naturally a plausible explanation was that the killer may have been a puppet master with a sadistic sense of humor. As of yet, it wasn't confirmed if it was the action or a vigilante or if Orochimaru sent an agent to silence Mizuki in case he knew anything incriminating. Iruka's death however was, far more bizarre. The Yamanaka clan head cleared his throat and spoke hesitantly, almost as if he himself had difficulty believing the initial report, erm. The eternal Chunin, Kotetsu and Azuma were the first on the scene. After questioning eyewitnesses, they suspected that Aruka was having some kind of explosive diarrhea attack and was stuck in the restroom. A while later, they heard screaming like a, quote, screeching raccoon dragging its nails on a chalkboard, along with loud, om nom nom, noises. The screams died down for a bit and then another noise came that sounded, and again quote, a bear screaming into a megaphone, and finally came, loud and wet sounding explosion. When the eternal Chunin set foot in the crime scene, they puked immediately because the place was covered in fecal matter, blood, human organs and body parts. Apparently something chewed up and tried to eat Aruka, UP chucked him, jammed what was left down a toilet, and then the toilet exploded. Apparently they're still hosing the place down and picking up chunks of Aruka wherever they can find them. At the end of the report, Hiruzen blinked his eyes several times and finally spoke, in all of my days as a shinobi, I have seen all kinds of horrors that could churn your stomach. But I have never heard of such a gruesome and disgusting death before. Whoever killed Aruka like that must have truly hated him with every fiber of their being. And no one saw any suspects. Can you scan Aruka's brain? 
The blonde clan head sighed as he answered, Unfortunately the brain is believed to have already been destroyed when Aruka was chewed up. And no, no one saw anyone enter the restroom except the victim. Meaning the killer was already inside and had an alternate exit, or managed to slip in and out undetected. I also did some checking around, looking for anything that would suggest a motive, and I found something notable. In Aruka's apartment there were bank statements showing that he was receiving monthly payments from an unknown benefactor. And the sum is quite noteworthy. The Hokage tapped his fingers together thoughtfully and then took a drag from his pipe. It would seem that Aruka himself was involved in some dirty business as well. Was it connected to Mizuki or was it an altogether separate matter? Find out who is behind these payments. I want to know everything there is to know. And begin performing psych evals on all active duty ninjas regardless of rank, starting with those currently inside Konoha of course. I want to make sure we don't have any more traitors in our midst. Inoichi nodded his head and departed to carry out the Sandame's orders. The Hokage continued to hum thoughtfully and mused that there was no way that Mizuki or Aruka's deaths were coincidental. There was a strong likelihood that the perpetrator had killed both of them and was still at large. However, there was another concern on his mind, or more rather a simple curiosity in regards to Team 7. He couldn't help but wonder how they would function. After all, Team 7 was perhaps one of the most prominent teams in Konoha with a long history that had produced some of the most, in, famous ninjas in history, himself included. He was curious how the next generation would function, and more specifically, how Naruto would handle new challenges and adversity. After all, it wasn't just outside threats he would have to contend with, but his own teammates now. Meanwhile, Konoha Academy. Ah. Uh, why do we have to be assigned on the same team as you? Well, at least I have Sasuke-kun here. Sakura spoke and directed a small glare towards Naruto who seemed to be playing around with those cards of his. The witch doctor in training flipped her the bird since this wasn't a picnic for him either, he really wanted to practice hypnotic magic, if only to make Sakura shut her mouth, but he didn't want to risk exposing too much or too many of his potential abilities too soon, least of all in front of Sasuke. Divination and tarot readings were less conspicuous than manipulating minds, especially if something went south. Not to mention Naruto doubted that the Uchiha would have much interest in any techniques that didn't result in some kind of explosion or at the least in fatal injury given his obsession with power. He sighed in boredom since all the other teams had already left with their respective senseis and now here he was waiting for both Anko and Kakashi, and most unfortunately he had to wait with his two teammates. In regards to the latter, he knew the man only by reputation. Rumor had it that there was a betting pool amongst numerous ninjas in Konoha wondering if he'd be late to his own funeral and if he'd be buried with his entire Icha Icha collection. The reason for this, stemming from his chronic tardiness, unless it was for an ARS rank mission or a direct summons from the Hokage, the man would always be late by about three hours. He could only hope that Anko could rein him in and put a stop to that. What are you even doing, Naruto? Sakura asked him directly as she approached him likely out of boredom since she had little else to do, plus her curiosity had been piqued. She noticed the cards he was using and asked, since when do you do tarot card readings? Still, that's actually kinda neat. The blonde raised an eyebrow and replied, oh. Do you have an interest in it yourself? I have recently begun learning the trade, but it is still very interesting. Unfortunately, tarot readings aren't always clear. But if you ask nicely, I'll do a reading for you. He spoke with a small smile at the end believing this was actually the first time in forever he'd actually had a civil conversation with the Haruno. Please? The pinket asked politely, prompting the blonde to smile as he began shuffling the deck and asked her, so what kind of reading do you want? Perhaps you have a particular question in mind? Be forewarned that I can't guarantee desirable results or crystal clear answers. Divination tends to be rather vague. Ooh. Ooh. Can you do a reading about my love life? The pinket asked excitedly casting a small glance towards the Uchiha. The Jinchuriki couldn't help but roll his eyes since he suspected that's what she'd want, but she was polite about it so he would fulfill her request, but if she tried hitting him then it was a good thing he had a voodoo doll for Sakura prepared and ready. The whiskered teen then drew three cards from the deck and placed them in front of Sakura, he flipped the first card and spoke, you have been struggling to spark a connection with the object of your affections, he doesn't acknowledge you as a woman, much less an individual. At his words, the pinkette pursed her lips and frowned, not liking the news but there was definitely truth to it and she couldn't deny it. He then flipped the second card and spoke, you have possibly tricked yourself into believing that you love him, 
but he is dead inside and has no love to give in return. If you continue to pursue him you will only find misery and torment. At that, the pinkette swallowed dryly as she took in his words, her fist clenched but she didn't make a move to punch him, yet. Finally, Naruto flipped the third card and he raised an eyebrow, it seems that there is a possibility of redemption in your future. You'll have an opportunity to abandon your pursuit for Sasuke and find happiness with another who will love and cherish you and treat you with proper respect. The pinkette's green eyes widened a bit at that and she relaxed a bit since there was perhaps some good news. There was an awkward silence between them for a moment until the pinkette muttered, Um, thanks for the reading. Naruto. He gave her a small smile and tipped his hat to her, and then on closer inspection, he noticed something peeking out from under the sleeve of her dress, it looked like a very dark bruise on her arm. Sakura. Why do you have a bruise on your arm? He asked out of curiosity, his question making her stiffen up as she followed his gaze then pulled her sleeve down to cover the bruising once more. She then muttered a quick, I fell, excuse that the blonde simply wasn't buying. Were there more under her clothes that she was hiding? He had heard that abusers would usually aim for sections of the body that could be covered by clothing to hide the injuries. Perhaps this one was off the mark? Let's see what the cards have to say about your injuries. Naruto suggested but was stopped when the pinkette grabbed him by the wrist, preventing him from shuffling his deck. There was a look of pure terror in her eyes as she stared at him, pleading for him not to do it. Please don't, I don't want to be punished. She muttered fearfully, making the blonde realize that perhaps Sakura wasn't actually the person he believed her to be. For as long as he'd known her, she was always a loud mouthed, over the top fangirl and bully that would always punch him for the slightest excuse and sometimes for no reason at all. Was that also a result of the abuse she was suffering? Did one or both of her parents put her up to bullying him and chasing after Sasuke? Did she actually trick herself into believing she loved the Uchiha to appease her parents? Naruto blinked his eyes and asked, Sakura? Are your parents abusing you? Are they making you do things you don't actually want to do? He asked, trying to probe her for information, and it seemed like she wanted to answer him but she was too afraid to speak. I'm sorry, for everything. She spoke and then turned away and retreated into a corner seat, trying to put some distance between herself and the blonde. The whiskered teen said nothing but he wasn't about to let this slide. Not in good conscience. It would seem the Loa would be gaining another soul soon, but first he needed to confirm if it was one or both of Sakura's parents. Though if he had to bet money, he strongly suspected that Kazashi was the guilty party given his obsession with wealth and status. Most likely he was pressuring Sakura into chasing after Sasuke to try and gain access to the Uchiha's money and anything else of value that would be in his possession. That only left the question of Mebuki's involvement to be answered. Come to think of it, given the fact Kazashi is undoubtedly abusing his own daughter and was a longtime enemy of Kashina and by extension a personal enemy of Naruto himself, the Jinchuriki would be killing two birds with one stone. The door to their classroom suddenly opened with both Jonan entering inside, Anko had her hands stuffed into her pockets with a cheeky grin while a masked man that could only be Kakashi had his face buried in a certain orange book. He looked at the three genin lazily and took notice of the brooding Uchiha, a depressed looking pinket and the blonde Jinchuriki that tipped his hat to him and Anko. This is going to be fun. Meet us on the roof in five minutes. The masked Jonin spoke and then he and Anko vanished in a swirl of leaves. Both Sakura and Sasuke got up from their seats but noticed that Naruto had already disappeared. A few minutes later they arrived on the roof and found the whiskered teen laying his head in the dango lover's lap. Walk. How did you get here so fast? And what are you doing putting your head in one of our sensei's lap? Sakura asked in surprise, and felt somewhat jealous that a boy didn't have his head in her lap like that. It seemed like, a very affectionate gesture. Me and Anko-chan go way back, so don't worry about it. And I took the express elevator. The Jinchuriki replied with a dismissive tone, and by express elevator, he simply climbed out the window and scaled the side of the building using his chakra. A large part of him was glad he had consulted the snake mistress ages ago about chakra control exercises. There's an elevator, the pinket asked in confusion, making the other sweat drop a little. After a pregnant pause, Kakashi asked them to take a seat so they could get started. Both the Uchiha and Haruno took sat down on some nearby steps prompting the copy ninja to speak, good. We're all here, usually. The standards one Jonin and three Jonin students, but these are special circumstances so we'll be having two Jonin. Myself and Anko-san, how about we get started and introduce ourselves? 
The Pinket wanted to ask him what he meant by introductions, but was beaten to the punch when the Uzumaki spoke, You and Anko Chan are the Jonin. You two go first. Let the lady start off. The two Jonin nodded in agreement since that seemed fair. Anko cleared her throat and spoke, I'm the taken but still sexy and dangerous Anko Mitarashi. Feel free to call me Anko Sama. I work in the torture and interrogation division under Ibiki and Inoichi. My likes are Dango, Snakes, Naruto kun, and pretty much anyone I care about. My dislikes are, I don't feel like talking about that, cuz there's a lot for me to list off. My hobbies are trying out different torture techniques on criminals, mainly rapists, for example, dancing, training, and hanging out with Naruto kun. My goal for the future is to kill a certain rogue nin, then maybe someday settle down and enjoy life to the fullest with my family. Sakura cringed a bit at the mentioning of torture but she had to acknowledge that it was a necessary evil in a shinobi village. Kakashi gave a small eye smile and then began his own introduction, my name is Kakashi Hitaki. Nice to meet you, I have many likes and dislikes, numerous hobbies, and I haven't yet thought of my dreams for the future. At the end of that half-assed introduction the other sweat dropped since he only revealed his name. So the dango lover decided to correct that. Translation he likes the Ika Ika series, dislikes anyone that only calls it porn. His hobby is collecting Ika Ika merchandise and autographs. And his dream is to someday star in an Ika Ika movie adaptation. Anko spoke with a shit-eating grin, earning a harsh glare from the silver-haired man. But it is porn. So basically Kakashi Sensei wants to be a porn star. Naruto pointed out, making the Jonin's eye twitch angrily at his statement. It's not porn. It's art and way to ruin my, cool sensei, image. The masked man grumbled as he crossed his arms with a huff. Pretty sure they would have figured it out and the image would be ruined anyway. Both pariahs spoke in perfect unison, making the masked man feel like he'd been pierced through the chest by a lance since he couldn't argue with that. Moving on, I'm Naruto Uzumaki. I like to read and study new techniques, experiment with said techniques, Anko-chan and anyone else that I consider a loyal friend. My dislikes are people that wear masks, uchihas, negligent assholes, people that can't tell the difference between a sword and its sheath, and most recently toads. My hobbies, you don't need to know about my hobbies. And my dream for the future is to become Hokage to stick it to everyone that trampled over me, and to kill a certain Sharingan user wearing a mask, not you Kakashi, someone else. The blonde clarified at the end making the Jonin sigh in relief since he was certain he wouldn't want to become an enemy of Minato and Kashina's child, most particularly because of the latter. They then turned to Sakura and looked at her expectantly, as if asking her to go next. She stiffened up a bit under their gazes and squeaked out, I'm Sakura Haruno. They waited for her to continue but it seemed she was done speaking for now, by the looks of it, she wasn't ready to open up, but Naruto guessed she didn't want to say anything because she was likely afraid that she may say something incriminating about her family. Grunting impatiently Sasuke piped in, forget the bimbo. My name is Sasuke Uchiha, don't forget it. I don't have many things that I like, except for power and strong jutsu techniques. My dislikes, I have many of those. And I don't believe in things like dreams, but I do have a goal that will become reality. I will restore my clan and kill a certain someone. At that, Naruto got up from Anko's lap and jabbed the tip of his cane up one of Sasuke's nostrils making the Uchiha yelp in pain and stumble back clutching at his nose. The hell was that for Dobi? The self-proclaimed Avenger shouted angrily. First off, that is no way to speak about a lady. Second, you don't seem to be making much progress in either part of your goal. Third, stop with the whole mysterious act, we all know the story about Itachi. And finally, because you're a douchebag that deserved it. Naruto listed off and then slammed the head of his cane into the top of the Uchiha's head for extra measure to get his point across. Are you serious Dobi? You're going to defend her? She's been pummeling you since day one and now you're defending her? The Uchiha questioned, glaring angrily at the blonde as he rubbed the top of his head where the blow had landed. Naruto was silent for a moment, it was true Sakura had beaten him almost daily and treated him like trash but he never raised against her mainly because of the fact he didn't believe in harming women, especially if it was an unfair fight, and because if he did try to defend himself her father would use it as an excuse to rain hell on him. Plus, with recent revelations, he suddenly realized that Sakura's one-dimensional character was but a forced facade. 
Yeah, I am serious. And it appears that I am. I have my reasons for it. Word of advice Sasuke, you won't live for very long if you're an asshole to everybody. Like us or not, I don't care, but we're stuck with each other. So I'll make you a deal, act in a civil manner, and I'll respond in kind. Act like an ass, I'll make your life very miserable. Get the picture. Naruto asked at the end and pointed the tip of his cane towards Sasuke's face to emphasize his point. The Uchiha defiantly sneered at him. Kakashi decided to step in and break the hostile atmosphere by saying, Well, you're all certainly, unique. In your own ways. Now we must come to the matter of your genin exam. At the masked Jonin's words, the genin all turned to him with Sakura asking, What do you mean by that? We already passed the exam. Naruto adjusted his top hat and piped in. I suspected that there was another exam waiting for us. The initial exam is to find the students that have the potential of becoming genin. Our Jonin senseis then conduct their own test to see if we can truly make the cut. Both Jonin nodded with Anko responding, Good instincts kiddo. We'll be conducting your test tomorrow at 8 a.m. in training ground 7. I wanted to do it at old 44, but Kakashi said it'd be too extreme for you greenhorns. She then glanced over at Naruto and winked at him, knowing that he could safely navigate the forest of death. The other two, not so much. Well, that's all there is to it for today. Though I recommend you don't eat breakfast tomorrow, otherwise you might just puke it up. Be seeing you. Kakashi spoke before giving a lazy salute and then vanishing in a puff of smoke. Both Sakura and Sasuke departed from the roof, leaving the two pariahs alone. Jeez Naruto. I knew you had a strong respect for women but you seemed pretty triggered. I thought you hated Sakura. What gives? Anko questioned now that they were alone, finding it odd the blonde had changed his tune about the pinkette so quickly. For the longest time I did, until today when I noticed something. Sakura had a bruise on her, a pretty nasty looking one. I asked her about it and she started to freak out. I think she's being abused at home and has been forced to act the way she normally does in her school life. The whiskered teen replied as he tipped his hat, the rim shadowing his eyes. The snake mistress' eyes narrowed as she replied, if that is true, it would explain quite a bit. What do you want to do about it? Gonna report it? I could, but Kazashi has an army of lawyers working for him. Unless there's concrete proof, he'll just have the whole thing dismissed and Sakura could end up in an even worse situation. I'm gonna do some recon, figure out how to best handle the situation. Last thing I want to do is walk in blind. He responded as scratched his cheek. I see what you mean. But if either of us gets caught snooping around the Haruno residence, Kazashi will give us all hell. Anko muttered in a disgruntled tone knowing that he would use the slightest excuse to indict them. Naruto thought for a moment and then produced Sakura's voodoo doll and muttered, I think I might have a way to work around that. Meanwhile. Naruto's apartment. The sounds of sawing and hammering could be heard as an army of straw dolls could be seen shuffling about the place. One group could be seen cutting through the floor as if trying to make an opening for a stairway while others removed bad electrical wires and gas lines and then replaced them. While another group seemed to be building even more dolls like themselves. As one could easily surmise, these were no ordinary dolls, nor were they technically voodoo dolls. Naruto liked to refer to them as proxies, dolls possessed by spirits subservient to the Loa, and by extension Naruto due to his contract. One of their first orders of business was to continue building their numbers and converting Naruto's apartment complex into a worthy shrine for the Loa, a working laboratory for Naruto's magical experiments and training and also a shop to possibly draw in more wayward souls. Heave ho, heave ho, came the collective chant of all the dolls as they milled about their business. There was suddenly a loud knocking coming from the apartment door, prompting the dolls to scatter and hide about in their patron's apartment. The door opened revealing an aging man in his sixties or so with a beer gut and balding head, Oi, brat. People have been complaining about weird lights and noises. What the hell are you doing in here? The landlord asked as he barged inside. It was bad enough that the boy's presence discouraged people from taking any apartments in the complex, but now people who weren't even tenants were complaining of odd happenings. Come out. I know you're in here. And what the hell have you been doing to this place? You don't have permission to do any changes or makeovers. The landlord continued to shout as he entered the living area and then observed a shelf full of half-finished straw dolls. Just what could that demon have been up to? Last chance you little shit, or I'm going to evict you and throw you out in the streets. He shouted again, 
his words now angering the proxies who found this human to be annoying and they didn't like how he spoke about their patron. The landlord heard some chittering noises and saw something move in a nearby corner. Were there rats infesting the place or something now? He then took notice of an array of masks that were mounted on the wall, with a shrine and numerous offerings placed in front of them. Growing curious, he approached and reached out to touch the masks, only for a series of glowing purple eyes to snap open and the masks roared and screeched angrily in his face making him stumble back in shock. The proxies took the chance to leap from their hiding places and tossed out several bags full of marbles which rolled under the nosy landlord's feet making him start flailing about to get his balance, only for him to slip and fall to the floor hard. He screamed in pain believing he'd thrown his back out, and then he saw a pair of hammers come down to his face, and everything went black. The next moment he opened his eyes, he found himself suspended upside down with his hands and legs tied by wires hundreds upon hundreds of straw dolls dancing and chanting carrying numerous tools and weaponry that was fit for their size. And under him, was a cauldron with boiling water inside. He tried to scream for help, but an apple had been crammed inside his mouth, forcing his jaws wide apart and his teeth were sunk inside the apple's flesh and he couldn't muster the force to bite down hard enough. The apartment door opened, causing the straw dolls to stop their activities and turn towards the entrance, for standing in the doorway was both Naruto Uzumaki and his longtime friend Anko. Um. What the hell is going on in here? The dango lover asked, clearly seeing the scene with her own eyes, but her mind was having difficulty processing exactly what was happening. She saw a veritable army of straw dolls, and some old guy hanging above a boiling cauldron. Naruto chuckled nervously as he scratched the back of his head and replied to her, Ah. Anko, I guess I hadn't yet explained everything to you. I was going to tell you after we officially became a team, but well, this is happening. The short version is that I'm a witch doctor, a practitioner of the voodoo arts after forming a contract with the Loa. Voodoo spirits and or gods. And these little guys are what I call proxies, who serve the Loa and myself. And they seem to be in the process of dunking my landlord headfirst into a cauldron filled with boiling water. The snake mistress was silent for a few moments and then knelt down and tickled the belly of one of the proxies making it let out a squeaky giggle, ah. They're cute. She gushed finding the little dolls to be utterly adorable causing them to begin giggling more with their body language showing that they were now feeling bashful and happy at the praise. They may look cute, but they're pretty devious. Still, they're very productive and loyal workers. And you took the news surprisingly well all things considered. The blonde pointed out, since he was sure that Anko would at least be shocked by the revelation of his new powers. Not sure if I believe in voodoo or hoodoo or whatever it is you do, but I do have a piece of Orochimaru's soul living inside my neck, so I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. Let me take a guess and say that you needed something to help give you an edge, yeah? She asked at the end, causing the blonde to nod since she hit the nail on the head. Fortunately, she was a fairly open-minded individual. Hey fellas? Can you bring me these ingredients? I need to make some special adjustments to one of my voodoo dolls. Naruto asked and then wrote down a list of ingredients on a slip of paper and gave it to the proxies. They saluted and happily chittered as a group retreated into the back with the list, and a few moments later returned with a picnic basket filled with the requested items. Voodoo dolls huh? The kind that you stick with a needle and the person actually feels it? Anko asked, having heard stories of such magic and seen it in movies and such things. The same. But it's also possible to use the dolls for other things, We'll be turning Sakuras into our own little spy to gather information for us. Naruto replied as he accepted the basket from the proxies who were bowing respectfully to him. Noise. Sue, what about your landlord? Should we get him down or something? The snake user asked, pointing towards the still screaming civilian that they had been ignoring, his face turning red due to the blood rushing to his head and his own anger and distress. Nah. He's an asshole that's been looking for an excuse to kick me out for ages. Plus, if the current state of this building is anything to go by, he's a crap landlord. Mind if I crash at your place Anko Chan? These guys are doing some construction projects for my apartment and it'll be difficult for me to work with all the noise. Naruto asked with a chuckle. Feel free to swing by any time, for any reason. Now let's see about making Mini Sakura our little spy. Anko spoke excitedly and then pinched the blonde's butt making him jump a bit, while the proxies let out perverse giggles. The blonde tipped his hat to the purple-haired woman and winked at her before addressing the proxies, fellas, as you were. 
With that, the two pariahs departed and the little straw dolls resumed their ritualistic dance and began to lower the landlord into the boiling water. Today was just another day for Naruto, and great changes to the world were fast approaching. But first things first, they needed to help an innocent victim. Sakura yawned tiredly as she rubbed her eyes, her stomach growling since she had skipped breakfast and she was now starting to deeply regret it. She looked over toward Sasuke who was in much the same boat as she was, although he seemed to hide it better since he was scowling as per usual. The only ones missing were Naruto and their senseis. Where could they be? She wanted to get this stupid test over with and get something to eat, she was already skinny enough as it was, if she lost any more weight she could end up a skeleton. Morning. Came the curt greeting of a familiar voice, the pinkette looked up and saw the form of Naruto standing next to her, a small smile on his face as he tipped his hat to her. The pinkette gave a half-hearted greeting as her stomach rumbled loudly which made Naruto chuckle a bit. Uh oh. Grumbly tummy. I had a strong feeling this would happen. The witch doctor spoke then placed a picnic basket full of bentonite on the ground and continued to speak, you better eat. A ninja can't fight on an empty stomach. Oi. Sasuke, I may hate your guts, but you can have some too. At that, the Uchiha scoffed loudly and muttered something about how, Uchihas don't accept charity. While Sakura swallowed hard as her stomach roared louder than ever. She was quite touched by Naruto's generosity and kindness but she was still hesitant to accept. But Kakashi sensei said we shouldn't have breakfast. Sakura pointed out, prompting the Jinchuriki to lazily twirl his cane while shaking his head. Au contraire Sherry. He said that he recommended it. He didn't give us a direct order not to. That aside, if you were performing any kind of test, wouldn't you want to have a full meal and be prepared for it? Naruto asked in a rhetorical manner, making the Haruno realize he had a strong point. Without a proper meal in her belly she wouldn't be able to think or function properly. Can I have a bento please? She asked politely, not wanting to anger the one who was offering her food. The blonde gave a warm smile and used the tip of his cane to gently push the basket towards the pinkette and replied, knock yourself out. I already ate. With that being said, Sakura wasted no time in opening the basket and fished out a bento and popped it open. She hungrily scarfed down the contents with gusto and enjoyed the home-cooked meal. A few minutes and bentos later Sakura was now lying on the ground with her belly animatedly bulging out a bit as she sighed in satisfaction. That was just what I needed. Thanks a bunch. I owe you big time. She spoke with a smile, which faded a bit as she muttered, I owe you for a lot really. Naruto only tipped his hat to her and replied, think nothing of it. Just being a good teammate and all, plus I think you have enough to worry about without me making things harder for you. His response made the pinkette pale a bit since she knew exactly what he meant by that. Sensing her fear the whiskered teen spoke, relax. I'm not gonna get you in trouble or anything. You want to talk about it? He asked politely but the pinkette quickly shook her head negatively. He could only shrug since he couldn't force it out of her, she then took notice of some dark circles developing under his eyes. Naruto? Did you sleep any last night? She asked making the blonde chuckle and wave his hand in a dismissive manner as he replied, appreciate the concern, but I'm fine. Stayed up late working on a special project. She pursed her lips for a moment, hoping that he would be fit and ready for whatever test their teachers would throw their way but for now she'd have to take him at his word, and perhaps more importantly, there was something that was bugging her, hey Naruto. Why, why are you being so nice to me all of a sudden? I was utterly horrible to you, so you don't have to act all sweet. She pointed out with a somber expression. The Jinchuriki adjusted his top hat and replied to her, true. I don't, have to, but given certain circumstances that came to my attention, I've decided to be the bigger man and forgive and forget any petty grievances we had in the past. Though please indulge my curiosity, do you really like Sasuke? At his question the pinket scoffed and ran a hand through her hair with a frown. Hell number. Sasuke is rude, callous, thinks way too highly of himself and he has no respect for anyone much less women. Sakura grumbled low enough that the Uchiha couldn't hear, though she doubted he was paying any real attention. At her words, the Uzumaki smirked a bit since she had hit the nail on the head. A part of him wondered if most of the fangirls were attracted to Sasuke because he was unattainable or because they were masochists that enjoyed how coldly he treated them. Who was to say? The only legit reason anyone would pursue the Uchiha was undoubtedly his money. True he was good looking, 
but he was about as cuddly as a cactus. You could try embracing it, but it certainly won't end well. A few minutes later, their senseis finally arrived, Anko had a sadistic smirk on her face while Kakashi was giving a friendly eye smile. Good morning everyone, thanks for waiting, the masked Jonan spoke. You're late. Sakura spoke in a deadpan tone then tossed an empty bento box towards the copy ninja, the container bouncing off his head with a soft, thunk. He sweat dropped a bit and chuckled since he kinda deserved that, but the truth was both he and Anko were observing how their team acted when they weren't present. And he was pleasantly surprised that Naruto acted thoughtfully and in a mature manner. Sakura seemed to be getting along with the blonde in spite of numerous stories suggesting they hated one another in the academy, although Sasuke, quite unsurprisingly seemed to have deliberately made himself the odd man out, his overinflated ego and belief in Uchiha's superiority would be factors the Jonin would have to take careful consideration of. Well, now that we're all present we can get started. Kakashi spoke and then reached into his pocket. A moment later, he pulled out a pair of bells and spoke, the goal is relatively simple. Both myself and Anko will each carry a bell. All you have to do is steal a bell from us by any means necessary before your time runs out. The genin who doesn't have a bell shall be sent back to the academy. We'll give you ten minutes to get a head start and think up any strategies you may want to use. Make it count. Your grace period starts now, and once it ends you'll have two hours to secure a bell and then, we'll be coming for you. At that, Anko smirked and pulled out a stopwatch and clicked it, starting their ten minutes to get ready. Come on Sakura, let's get some distance first. Naruto suggested, making the pinket nod as they ran into the nearby trees with Sasuke fleeing in the opposite direction making the two Jonin sigh. It seemed Naruto has already assumed the leadership role in the trio with Sasuke acting the part of the lone wolf. Jankin. Winner gets first dibs. Anko offered since it seemed to be the fairest way for them to pick their prey. The masked ninja nodded and played a round of Jankin with the dango lover only to lose when he chose scissors and she chose rock. Naruto or Sasuke? Kakashi asked, wondering who his partner would want to pursue. He had a strong feeling that she'd pick Sasuke and use this test as an excuse to beat the crap out of the Uchiha for shits and giggles. I'll go after Naruto-kun. I wanna see what kind of tricks he's got up his sleeve. I expect you to rough up the little asswipe Uchiha, got it? She asked, though it seemed like she was giving an order. The copy ninja had no right to object, he knew that Sasuke would need to be fed a large piece of the humble pie, and he sincerely hoped the Uchiha wouldn't have to choke on it for both their sakes. The two Jonin nodded to each other and set off to locate their targets. Meanwhile, Haruno residence, Marikai Haruno couldn't help but wonder, how could she have fallen so low? She always knew she wouldn't be happy being married to Kazashi, he only married her for her money and it was an arranged marriage so there was nothing she could have done about it. Ever since he'd been thrown out of the shinobi corps, Kazashi had become obsessed with success, power and wealth, the former two he felt robbed of after his dishonorable discharge. She had hoped that when Sakura was born, fatherhood would have changed him and made him a better man, it did not. And he became even worse after the Uchiha massacre. With Sasuke being the only survivor and heir to the Uchiha fortune, he was sitting atop a great big pile of money and of course the entire Uchiha district. To many people, Sasuke was but a meal ticket for something. More sharing than users, more money, political influence, and so forth. Sasuke had become a deep obsession and, holy grail, amongst the population, most particularly social climbers and gold diggers like Kazashi himself, and he was willing to do anything to get what he wanted. Her musing was broken when the doorbell rang. Marikai quickly checked herself in the mirror to ensure her makeup was hiding any bruising before she went to the door and checked through the peephole. She found nobody there and slowly opened the door and saw that a package had been left behind. It wasn't marked so whoever sent it had to have hand delivered it. Growing curious she quickly brought the box inside and locked the door behind her. She brought the package over to the kitchen and quickly opened it. Inside was an envelope that was signed, from a special someone a multi-tool, and a doll that was a perfect likeness of her daughter Sakura. She picked up the doll and inspected it, finding that it was made with a lot of care and detail. It had pink yarn for hair, cute jade green buttons for eyes and the clothes seemed to have been hand-stitched. 
she actually found it sweet that someone would give this to her daughter and would also send something practical for her to use as well. But who sent it? She very much doubted that Uchiha boy would be able to make something so precisely and delicately like this. She wanted to tear open the envelope and see if it provided some clue, but she decided not to since it was her daughter's business and she didn't want to snoop any further than she already had. She picked up the doll, multi-tool and envelope and took them to her daughter's room and gently placed them on her bed for her to find when she got back. For now, she had to enjoy whatever peace she had while her husband was out schmoozing the daimyo, trying to get into the man's inner circle. She sighed and left Sakura's room and shut the door behind her. When she was gone, the Sakura doll sat up on its own and then picked up the tool under its arm and hopped off the bed to begin investigating for the boss. It saw a diary on the other side of the room, sitting on a nearby desk. Seemed like a good place to start. The doll hopped off the bed and scurried over easily climbing up the chair leg and scurried up onto the seat. It then used the soft cushion to bounce up and land atop the desk right in front of the diary. It then opened the diary and began skimming over the contents. The first few entries were scribblings and crayon drawing that a child would make, so it skipped on ahead to later pages, and then found something much darker. 3 14 Dad is yelling at Mom again. I can't understand what they're saying. But it sounds bad. Mom seemed really upset when she saw my back. I told her I'd been bad and Dad had to punish me with his belt, why did he do that? I can't remember what I did to deserve it. She didn't say anything but she looked scared then hugged me. And then she told me to stay in my room and never come out. 3 15 Mom is in the hospital. I heard a loud crash last night and saw flashing red lights outside my window. Dad told me to say that she fell and a vase fell and hit her. He made me clean up and throw away the broken vase and scrub the carpet. There was a lot of blood, my hands don't feel clean anymore. No matter how much I wash them. 5 23rds, it has been a while since my last entry. My mom finally came out of the hospital a week or so ago. She acts like nothing happened, but she seems scared all the time. I think, no, I know dad hurt her and is bullying her. I want to do something. 5 26 I did something. I tried to call the authorities, but dad hurt me. Bad, I think my arm was almost broken. Then he hurt mom even more, I think I heard something snap. He said that if I tried to do it again, he'd do even worse to her. Then he told mom if we ever tried to leave, I don't think I want to write that part down. I'm scared. I don't like it here. This isn't a family or a home. It's a prison. 6 19 I'll be starting at the academy today. I'll get to be a kunoichi once I graduate, but I'm scared. I'm scared all the time when at home. Kazashi wants me to try and hook up with some Sasuke kid. I remember the Uchihas, a lot of them reminded me of Kazashi. I don't like them. 6 20th. Second day in school, I talked to this Naruto kid today. He seemed nice. He didn't tease me or make fun of my forehead. Kazashi tells me to bully him and beat him every chance I get. I don't understand why. What's his beef with Naruto? I don't get it, but I don't want mom getting hurt. I have to do what he says, I wish it didn't have to be this way. I wish that Kazashi would just die. The doll quietly growled as it found the occasional signs of teardrops and blood amidst the later pages. It noticed how Sakura went from calling her father, dad, to Kazashi, and that the man himself was using both mother and daughter against each other to force them into compliance. It ripped out a blank page from the back part of the diary and grabbed a pen that was resting inside a mug on the desk. It scribbled something on the paper and tossed it to the floor and then climbed over to the window and tapped on the glass with the multi-tool. A few proxies peeked around the corners as the Sakura doll hopped down to the floor and then held up the sheet of paper for the straw dolls to see. On the paper was written, Abuse confirmed. Mother, daughter victims. Send reinforcements and alert boss. The proxies nodded to the spy doll and gave some quick salutes as they scurried off to the side with one of them tapping in Morse code on a pipe for the rain gutter above. On the roof, another group of proxies received the message and picked up a pocket mirror and pointed it towards another group of fellow proxies on another roof across the street and angled the mirror to flash the light in their direction. Then the next group passed it along by picking up a set of flags and communicating in semaphore. And so the news was passed from one group of proxies to the next, rooftop by rooftop, street by street, 
until it reached the main bulk of their forces in Naruto's apartment whom they affectionately refer to as, the boss. The last lookout was sitting at the window looking through a pair of binoculars when it saw the message. After receiving the news it had been waiting for, the proxy darted off, facing towards the vast and ever-growing army of straw dolls as they continued their revamping and construction of the boss's apartment complex and soon-to-be shop, lab while others continued building more and more straw doll bodies for more spirits to inhabit. Stufu, the lookout screeched causing all of its fellow proxies to stop whatever they were doing and look in the direction of the shout. The lookout began angrily jabbering and wildly flailed its tiny arms about as it explained everything it had just learned. At that the other proxies quickly joined in and began screeching angrily, feeling furious that an innocent child and her mother was being harmed. Chu wo, chu wo, fo de basu, fo de basu, the proxies chanted in unison and dropped their tools. They all ran towards a series of dumbwaiters and began to line up and form several large groupings, each group took a dumbwaiter which was then quickly lowered down its respective shaft that they had built over time which went all the way down to the sewers. A bugle call for, to arms, trumpeted as the numerous straw dolls began to assemble and collect their weapons and began boarding a series of boats floating in the sewer water, or toy cars parked near tunnels that weren't filled with water. Another bugle call came signaling, charge, and the sounds of tires squealing along the floor and little motors revving could be heard as the proxies sped off to the Haruno residence with all haste, the little straw dolls gibbering and buzzing like a swarm of angry hornets that were out for blood as they sped off. Meanwhile, in Naruto's apartment, the Lois sent a telepathic message to their contractor to alert him of the situation, it appeared the proxies were a little too quick to act and felt the need to keep young Naruto in the loop. Meanwhile, training ground 7. Naruto couldn't help but chuckle a bit which made Sakura quirk up an eyebrow and ask, what's so funny? You do realize that we're in the middle of what might be our most important test, right? The pinkette pointed out with a twitching eyebrow. The blonde smiled apologetically and replied, sorry. I was just thinking that my late night project may have worked a little too well. Now what were we discussing? He asked since the Loa's telepathic message made him forget what he was previously talking about with the Haruno. She gave a disgruntled sigh and flicked him on the forehead to snap him out of his stupor as she spoke, Wake up already Baka. You were about to tell me what you knew about our senseis, how are we supposed to get the bells from them? The whiskered teen snapped his fingers and muttered, Ah. Right, first and foremost, Anko has been my friend for a long time now. She uses snake summons, knows a lot of various poisons, and she specializes in fire jutsu. Though I strongly doubt she'd use her poisons on us. As for Kakashi, I mostly know him by reputation but he is known to have a transplanted Sharingan eye, a former Anbu captain and is said to have copied over a thousand jutsu. Both of them are extremely experienced, it won't be easy to dupe them. Now I feel like we have even less of a chance. This is utterly impossible, there's no way any academy student can beat a Jonin. Sakura lamented sadly and began to run her hands through her hair frantically as Naruto adjusted his top hat. Not impossible. Just difficult. Still, no matter how skilled or experienced a ninja is, they can still be taken by surprise or get careless. One moment of hesitation, or lapse of attention is all it takes for someone to end up dead in the heat of battle. The Jinchuriki spoke with a smirk as he stabbed his cane into the ground and leaned against it. The Pinket gave a small glare and mumbled, yeah. But again, how are we supposed to get a hold of one of those bells? At her question the blonde tilted his hat and chuckled a bit with a confident smirk. I'm not so sure the bells are actually the point. Three genin. Two bells. Do the math. He spoke making the pinkette raise an eyebrow for a second, and then it clicked in her mind. The answer was so obvious. It was utterly impossible for a lone and inexperienced genin to overpower a seasoned jonin, but a team of genin working together could somehow trick said jonin. The bells themselves were but a prop, a diversion to make them splinter and fight amongst themselves to keep them. If they were going to pass, they needed to prove they could work together. As a team, easier said than done since Sasuke was meant to be part of their team. Sensing that Sakura had reached the same conclusion as himself, he spoke, as far as teamwork is concerned, Sasuke is definitely the weakest link. However talented he may be, his reckless attitude and ego is sure to one day get him killed, or worse. But I digress, if we want to pass, we need him. Period. I suspect that since Sasuke went off on his own, our senseis will divide and conquer. 
so then either Anko sensei or Kakashi sensei will arrive at any moment, and if we both go then we'll have both Janin to deal with. We'll have a much better chance if we deal with them separately. Sakura spoke thoughtfully, prompting the whiskered teen to nod in agreement. Both Anko and Kakashi are good trackers. Anko has her snake summons, and I heard Kakashi can summon ninja hounds. One of us has to act the decoy to draw them off. If we can't get Sasuke to play ball, our test will become all the more difficult. Naruto muttered, although he did have a voodoo doll for Sasuke at the ready, he wanted to save it for emergencies. While it would be very much possible to force the Uchiha into compliance with the doll, it would defeat the whole point of the test to begin with. I'll do it. I'll try to draw them away as long as I can. To be honest, I'm not exactly prime Kunoichi material. I know that. I'm smart, but I don't have any practical skills to contribute to the team. As I am now, I'm just dead weight. The pinkette spoke, surprising the blonde at how quick to volunteer she was. He respectfully tipped his hat to her then placed it atop her head and gave her his sash belt. Those have my scent on them. Keep them on your person so you can trick the summons. I'll try and get Sasuke on board as quickly as possible. And by the by, with the right training, I'm sure you can live up to being a true Kunoichi. I'll be seeing you again shortly. Naruto spoke and then dashed off into the woods with Sakura gaining a look of determination on her face as she ran in the opposite direction, hoping to buy him some time. Fortunately, it didn't take Naruto very long to find the Uchiha, but unfortunately Kakashi had found Sasuke first and it seemed like they were in a taijutsu fight, or more rather the copy ninja was toying around with the self-proclaimed Avenger. The Uchiha ferociously attacked the silver-haired man, trying desperately to get his bell but a swift kick from Kakashi sent the raven-haired boy flying back. The masked ninja took notice of the blonde's arrival and also noticed he was missing something as he spoke, good of you to join us Naruto. Your hat and sash seem to be missing, I'm guessing Sakura is trying to lead Anko away to give you a chance. Pretty smart and bold of you. Out of habit, the blonde proceeded to do a tip of the hat, then realized he wasn't wearing his top hat which made him blush a bit in embarrassment. The blonde turned towards the battered and bruised Uchiha and spoke to him in a snarky manner, having some trouble there Uke-kun. You look like you could use a helping hand. Sasuke glared angrily at the witch doctor in training and gave a sneer as he quickly brushed off his clothes and assumed his clan's taijutsu stance. Shut it Dobi. I don't need any help. Least of all from you. The Uchiha shouted, clearly believing he could handle the copy ninja all on his own, but both the blonde and the janin himself knew better. Naruto casually leaned against his cane with a smirk and casually flipped the bird to the Uchiha. You can take your pride and shove it where the sun doesn't shine, Sasuke. Pride and selfishness isn't going to help you pass this test. If you fail the team, not only will all three of us be sent back to the academy for another year, your goal of killing Aitachi will be all the more difficult, and I promise I shall make your life a living hell. Naruto spoke as he cleaned one of his ears with his pinky finger. I'd listen to him. Kakashi piped in, already guessing that the blonde had figured out the purpose of the exam, although it seemed that the Uchiha refused to listen as he charged on ahead and tried to attack the Janin. The copy ninja simply raised an arm up and blocked a kick from the Uchiha. The Janin smirked beneath his mask at the Uchiha's vain attempt, and then sensed another attack coming at him. He ducked down as a flash of steel appeared overhead, cutting off some of his hair as the Uzumaki seemingly flew past him before landing a short distance away. Nice try, but no cigar. Kakashi spoke, he had to admit that the blonde was smart to use the momentary distraction as a window to strike, but he underestimated his reflexes. A small laugh could be heard from the whiskered teen as he held a few strands of the copy ninja's hair between his fingers and replied, on the contrary sensei, I have exactly what I need. The janin quirked up a lone eyebrow as he quickly grabbed the Uchiha's leg and tossed him in the blonde's direction who sidestepped the Uchiha's form and chuckled when he landed in the dirt. Okay Uke kun I have what I need for us to achieve victory, but I'm gonna need you to help me with this technique. Naruto spoke with a malicious grin, which sent chills down the copy ninja's spine since it reminded him of Kashina when she was in her prime. Why should I hell, Ak? The Uchiha choked when the blonde shoved the copy ninja's hair down his throat and forced him to swallow it. Shut the fuck up and eat it Uke kun Secret art. Living voodoo doll. Naruto spoke and then yanked his fingers out from the Uchiha's mouth and then wiped them on the Avenger's shirt with a disgusted grimace. The Uchiha leapt to his feet and was about to scream at the Uzumaki, 
but the Jinchuriki reared his leg back and then kicked Sasuke in the groin, hard. Both Kakashi and Sasuke's bulged out of their heads as they sank to their knees. Holy shit! The masked Jonin whimpered out as he saw the blonde approaching him and then plucked the bell off of the Jonin with a smirk. The scarecrow could do nothing since he was too busy clutching at his groin, trying to make the pain go away. Kakashi wasn't sure how, but he guessed that the blonde used the hair sample he took to form some kind of link with the Uchiha, and then used that link to make him experience whatever pain the Uchiha felt. And thus, his current incapacitation was the result. I thank you for your noble sacrifice Uke kun there's a good man. Way to take one for the team. Naruto spoke with a laugh as he happily slapped the Avenger on the back. Sasuke seemed like he wanted to say something but his voice didn't seem to be working properly at the moment. Ah oh man. I missed the fun. Spoke another voice that could only belong to Anko, who was carrying a bound and gagged Sakura who had an apologetic look on her face for being caught so quickly. Seems you now have a bit of a hostage situation. Gonna risk the safety of your teammate? The dango lover asked with a grin and slapped the pinkette on the butt making her jump a bit. The snake user eyeing the bell that her favorite blonde had recently procured, suggesting that she wanted to trade the bell for Sakura. As this went on, Kakashi had to give props to his partner for putting the Uzumaki in a difficult situation. She's right. Either hand over the bell, or sacrifice your teammate. Kakashi spoke and forced himself onto his feet, the pain in his genitals easing off enough that he could at least move now. Naruto smirked as he scratched his nose and shook his head negatively. I refuse those options. I elect for a third one, bribery. Naruto spoke and seemingly produced the basket he had earlier out of nowhere then fished out one of the bentos from the bottom of the basket, he then popped it open and revealed some dango then continued to speak, Naruto Uzumaki's special secret recipe homemade dango. Just for you Anko-sama. Just kindly hand over your bell and Pinkie Pie and they're all yours. You can't be serious. You can't just bribe a. Eh? Kakashi tried to speak but was cut off when the snake user dumped the Haruno to the ground and gave the whiskered teen a bell before accepting the bento full of dango from him. So easily. The copy ninja yelled in shock, surprised that Anko had so easily taken the bribe of dango, however from the smell of them they must have been absolutely delicious. Naruto smirked triumphantly as he used his cane sword to cut through Sakura's bonds and let her loose as he held up the bells in victory. Seems it's my victory. Hey Kakashi, earlier you said that the genin that doesn't have a bell will be sent back to the academy. The blonde spoke which earned a nod of confirmation from the copy ninja. Correct. Now it falls to you to decide who gets to stay. Kakashi replied, knowing that this would be the major tipping point in Team 7's test, how would Naruto respond now that he had the power to choose the fate of his teammates? In response, Naruto took his cane sword, tossed a bell in the air and sliced it right down the middle. He caught both halves in an open palm then clenched his fist around them. He muttered something under his breath and a green light flashed in his fist for a moment. When he opened his hand again, it showed that the halves had somehow become two new bells, giving the blonde a total of three. He tossed two of the bells to both Sakura and Sasuke, and kept the third for himself. So then, we all have a bell now. The Uzumaki pointed out with a shit-eating grin. Kakashi sweat dropped at that, no one had ever actually managed to produce a third bell like that before. This was definitely a first in the history of Team 7's bell test. He had to give the Uzumaki credit for thinking outside the box, and from what he could tell, he had somehow prepared himself for a wide variety of scenarios, including a potential hostage situation. He was definitely a smart one like his father, and it seemed he had good leadership qualities as well. It seems that there isn't much choice in the matter. Team 7 passes, against my better judgment. Kakashi announced and turned his lone eye towards the Uchiha who was undoubtedly going to be the problem child in the group. He would need to keep the Uchiha on a tight leash, fortunately he also had Anko's help to ensure Sasuke's cooperation. Thank Kami. It's finally over. Sakura muttered, grateful that the Jinchuriki had given her a proper meal which gave her the needed energy to draw off Anko, even if only for a short time. The Dango lover greedily chewed on her snack and spoke between bites, yep. We'll be starting missions tomorrow. Meet up at the mission office at 10.30 in the morning, and don't be late. Kakashi? I'm talking to you. The Sharingan user chuckled nervously and nodded his head, since it seemed that she wasn't going to let him be late any further. Now that we've passed we should celebrate. Let's go out and get steak or something. Sasuke you're buying. Naruto spoke with a broad grin. 
earning nods of agreement from the rest of the team excluding Sasuke who was about to protest but a swift jab to the throat, courtesy of the Uzumaki, silenced him instantly. Sasuke was then dragged to his feet by both pariahs as the officially formed Team 7 went off to enjoy a celebratory meal. All the while thanking Sasuke for his apparent generosity, Naruto however knew that something very nice was about to happen, and it would be best to keep his teammate Sakura distracted for now. Meanwhile, Haruno residence. The Sakura spy doll let out a squeaky giggle as it snapped a rubber band, the form of Mebuki Haruno fast asleep on the living room couch thanks to a few fast dissolving drugs that was shot into her tea. The spy doll then took its multi-tool and scurried over the vents and with a flick of the multi-tool a screwdriver piece appeared allowing the doll to start unscrewing an air vent off the wall. The metal plating fell to the floor with a clank sound as proxies began pouring out of the vent en masse, some of them breaking off the main group into smaller ones to start uncovering the other vents and to open the windows to allow their forces easy entry. The proxies carried several rolls of duct tape over to Mabuki's sleeping form and began to tie her up in several layers of tape, with another strip covering her mouth to silence her in case she woke up. With their collective strength, the tiny straw dolls worked together to carry her over to a now-opened closet and locked her inside, placing a wedge under the door so it couldn't be opened from the inside. As the minutes ticked by, the Haruno residence had become utterly flooded with the little forms of straw dolls. One proxy dressed in little black robes stood on the kitchen counter standing next to a photograph of their target, the eyes on Kazashi's picture being replaced with X's and devil horns drawn on his head. The black-robed proxy seemed to be making a grand speech as it gibbered away while the others all listened intently, occasionally nodding their heads in understanding. The Sakura spy doll appeared from behind the picture and gave its own speech, angrily jabbering as it pointed towards Kazashi's photo, earning collective boos and jeers from the straw dolls. Some of them even threw their weapons at the picture, a series of needles, scalpels and other assorted weapons now piercing through the picture and its frame. The black-robed proxy then raised its little arms into the air as if it were speaking a prayer with all of the dolls following suit. Then the black-robed doll shouted, Fo de Basu. At that, the other dolls all joined in the chant, shouting, Fo de Basu. After that, they all scattered throughout the apartment and began to hide wherever there was room for them to fit under furniture, in cabinets and closets, out of sight in the other rooms as they waited for their target to appear. A short while later, their target finally arrived as he opened the front door and entered inside, locking the door behind him. He was whistling a happy tune to himself, obviously in a good mood for some reason. Mebuki? Sakura? Get out here! The pink-haired man shouted as he walked deeper into his home, unknown to him he was walking even further into a death trap. He was met only with silence and came to the conclusion that Sakura was still out on Kunoichi related business and Mebuki must have been out on errands since she had mentioned something about needing to get more groceries soon. He then stopped as he took notice of a picture on the kitchen counter that was now riddled with small weapons and scars after it had been mutilated. Who the hell did Thog? He screamed at the end as something sliced through the back of his ankles forcing him to his knees. The sounds of wild chittering and squeaky giggles could be heard as scores of tiny straw dolls came running out from their hiding places and surrounded him. The ex-shinobi yelled out in surprise as they started throwing their weapons at him, causing knives, scalpels and other small weapons to cut into his flesh with some of them managing to stick into his body. There was a sudden putt-putt sound as the pink-haired man felt something pierce deep into his buttocks making him yelp and turn around. He saw several groups of the dolls holding up some nail guns, they giggled sadistically at him as one pulled the trigger and began firing nails at him. He was peppered and pierced by numerous projectiles being fired and thrown at him forcing him to crawl away towards the entrance, which was likely his only means of escape. He cursed himself for going soft as a politician, but he still remembered his jutsu techniques. He began to run through hand signs to clear away these accursed dolls, but one in a black robe appeared and began chanting in a strange language. A green mist appeared and as soon as the ex-shinobi inhaled it, he felt strange. When he finished the final hand sign he attempted to unleash a fire technique to burn the straw dolls away, only for it to fizzle out. He wasn't sure how, but he knew they had somehow cut off his ability to properly use his chakra. In desperation, he forced himself to his feet and hobbled over to the door then lunged forward, his shoulder slamming into it with enough force to break it open. The proxies quickly gave chase after him refusing to let him escape as they continued throwing their weapons at him and fired more nails in his direction. The Haruno ran out into the street as fast as he could, 
trying his best to avoid falling to the ground as he ignored the pain in his ankles, his tendons screaming at him from the pain. He heard a series of bugle calls and looked over his shoulders and saw dozens of toy cars driving towards him, some of the bigger ones dragging wagons behind them with more nail guns and dolls pointing their weapons at him. He continued to limp and hobble away but he couldn't move fast enough to escape them as a barrage of nails continued to pierce into his body, turning him into a human pincushion. His vision started to blur as he was losing a lot of blood. A pair of toy cars with a long jump rope tied to them circled around his legs, the jump rope binding them and making him trip. Fo de basu! came a collective shout as the bugle call continued to play and trumpet. The sounds of pained screams could be heard as Kazashi was shot, pierced and stabbed to death in the village streets. What the fuck? came the shout of Kiba Inazuka, as he and his team arrived, having heard the sounds of Kazashi screaming. Kuranai then shouted, Stay back! I'll handle this! She drew a kanai and began to run through hand signs, then she stopped as the army of straw dolls suddenly began to retreat as a sunset bugle call could be heard. The toy cars sped away while the dolls that were on foot began to throw themselves down into the sewer drains and vanished out of sight. The genjutsu user decided to let them go and ran over to Kazashi, who was wheezing, gasping, and twitching. His body being riddled with hundreds or even thousands of tiny stab wounds and cuts with nails and other small cutting tools poking out from or piercing his flesh. After a few seconds, the light left his eyes and he stopped moving altogether. The genjutsu mistress pursed her lips for a moment, knowing there was nothing she could have done. Holy crap, that looked bad, like real bad. Kiba muttered as he and his teammates approached, with his canine partner letting out a spooked whimper. My insects are telling me those dolls were far from ordinary. The chakra in them felt strange and alien. Ancient even. It is difficult to describe. Shino spoke as he adjusted his shades, despite his stoic demeanor, his mind was still reeling with questions on what they had just witnessed. Are you effing serious Shino? Did you see those things? They were walking and moving about on their own. Of course they're not normal. They just killed a guy right in the middle of the street. The Inazuka shouted pointing at the doll's handiwork. Hanada stepped between her two teammates and piped in. What about the other Harunos? Could Sakura-san and her mother be in danger? At that, the two looked towards the Hyuga and realized that she had a point. Kuranai clapped her hands to get her students' attention, they all looked to her and waited for her to speak. This is now our first mission team. Kiba, go to the Hokage office and report this incident immediately, the authorities must be notified. Shino. Stay out here and ensure that no one touches the body or the crime scene, we must preserve the scene's integrity as much as possible. Hanada, you're going to find Sakura and make sure she's okay, and inform her of the situation. I'll take a look inside the Haruno household to perform a preliminary investigation. With that said, her genin nodded and went to perform their assigned tasks. The genjutsu mistress couldn't help but pinch her nose and sigh, never could she have guessed that a murder would be amongst the first things that her team saw showing proof of how violent and unpredictable a shinobi life could be. For now, she had to remain focused on task and check the Haruno's residence. She entered inside and found the floor littered with numerous small weapons and there was also a large number of nails that were scattered about. However, she could sense someone in a nearby closet with her chakra detection. She tiptoed inside, trying her best not to disturb the scene too much and found a wedge had been placed under the door to keep the closet occupant trapped inside. She removed it and opened the door and found a bound, gagged and unconscious Mebuki inside. From the looks of it, the Haruno's assailants didn't seem interested in harming the blonde woman, it was likely that her husband was their main target. She then noticed that there was something taped to Mebuki's form, some kind of diary and it seemed like certain pages had been bookmarked. She carefully removed the book and then checked the marked pages, and couldn't help but gasp in horror and cup a hand over her mouth. The Hokage would need to see this, immediately. Meanwhile in another part of Konoha, the Loa were smiling in content. Another soul had been claimed, a truly foul one no less, and they were certain there would be many more to come. Hiruzen had seen much death over the years, largely due to his occupation as a shinobi. He had been directly and indirectly responsible for the deaths of both allies and enemies over his career. He always regarded death with a certain degree of professionalism, knowing full well that it was a natural part of the job but never before had he taken any form of pleasure in the death of another human being, until today. He stared down at the form of the deceased Kazashi Haruno, which was now covered by a blanket. For many years now, 
the man had been a perpetual thorn in the Sandame's side and, according to many, was one of the main reasons behind the festering corruption within Konoha. Hiruzen certainly wouldn't miss his longtime enemy, most especially after learning that Kazashi had been abusing his family for years as evidenced by the highly graphic and detailed contents within Sakura Haruno's diary. He had only been given a brief summary by Kiba Inazuka who had briefly babbled about Kazashi being killed in the streets by little six-inch dolls driving toy cars. As ridiculous as it sounded, not only had there been a prior sighting of these dolls from the Mizuki incident, but also knew it had to be possibly linked to Uruka's death. Upon his arrival to the Haruno residence with his Anbu, Kuranai had filled him in on the rest, and said that she had found Mebuki Haruno unconscious and tied up in a closet with her daughter's diary taped to her body. This not only showed that Kazashi was the sole target, but it seemed like the killer wanted them to know the specific reason why Kazashi had been killed. It would seem that their mysterious killer operated with a vigilante mindset and the dolls were likely his minions. According to Kuranai and her team, the dolls quickly retreated into the sewers when they attempted to interfere. To be honest, it actually made perfect sense. The sewers were likened to that of a highly intricate maze much like the insides of an anthill. But if one knew how to navigate those tunnels, it is entirely possible to get virtually anywhere you wanted in Konoha, assuming you were small enough to fit in the smaller pipes and had the stomach to walk through all that filth, though for those dolls it wasn't an issue, not to mention it was likely their only means of being able to move about the village completely unnoticed, especially in great numbers. But who was their master? So far, it seemed this vigilante hasn't killed without just cause and hasn't yet attacked any innocents. A part of him wondered if this unknown person would be suitable for the Anbu division, after all, it wouldn't be the first time that any shinobi village has recruited a potential shinobi with questionable moral character but undisputed capabilities. So long as this vigilante doesn't harm innocents then he didn't see any real problem with recruiting them to his village's ranks. Sometimes, a cage needs someone that can make, certain problems, disappear. Minato had Kashina after all, and while the Yandaimi was hesitant to unleash his wife on anyone, just having her close by served as warning enough not to cross either of them. And if need be, well, let's just say Kashina was very good at her job. Hokage Sama. The form of Kuranai asked, breaking the Sandame out of his musings. He cleared his throat for a brief second, then turned towards the Genjutsu mistress, his face a stony mask. My apologies. I was just thinking about something. You were saying Kuranai san? The raven haired woman replied, Of course. I just mentioned that I sent my student Hanada to send word to Sakura of what transpired. At her report, the Hokage gave a brief nod of acknowledgement as he glanced over towards the form of Mebuki who was sitting off to the side wrapped in a security blanket as she tried her best to answer the Anbu's questions but it seemed that she couldn't remember anything noteworthy. Only that she fell asleep and woke up in the closet after being found by Kuranai. Hiruzen stroked his goatee a bit in thought as he came to a simple conclusion. Regardless of how this investigation turned out, at least one notable menace was now out of the way. Additionally, there was a strong likelihood that there would be some form of fallout and it would be best to be prepared for it. Meanwhile, way to be a good teammate Sasuke, treating us all to lunch. What a pal. Naruto spoke in a boisterous tone, roughly slapping the Uchiha on the back several times as the raven-haired boy's eye twitched in obvious annoyance. I didn't agree to any of this. You took my wallet. The Uchiha complained glaring harshly at the forms of Anko and Naruto, the latter waving around the Uchiha's wallet which was quite full of cold hard cash. Ah. Cheer up Sasuke. We're now celebrating since we're a team. Don't spoil the mood. Kakashi spoke with his signature eye smile, though it was still amusing to see the Uchiha's current state. Bring on the steak. I'm ready to chow down. Sakura spoke excitedly as she grinned in anticipation for the meal her cheerful mood being easily noticed by everyone. You seem happy. Something put you in a good mood Sakura-chan. Naruto asked as he gently tipped his hat to her, easily sensing the warm and fuzzy vibes basically rolling off of her. Plus, he had a very good idea why she was so happy, even if she herself wasn't yet aware of it. I dunno. I just feel so happy all of a sudden. And not just because we passed our sensei's test. Something good must have happened. The Pinkette spoke with a smile. As the newly minted team, minus one, enjoyed the atmosphere and small talk, Naruto saw something flash outside the window. 
he glanced in the direction of the flashing light that seemed to be coming from a rooftop and saw some of his proxy lookouts were using a mirror to reflect the sunlight to send a message in Morse code which translated as, mission accomplished. His earlier suspicions about Sakura's mood being confirmed since Kazashi was now dead and she was now free of him. All that was left was for the news to officially reach her, but he knew that would sort itself out. He gave a quick tip of the hat to the proxies and mouthed, job well done, to them earning a series of salutes from the distant dolls before they vanished out of sight. And just in time too as the restaurant staff brought Team 7 their meals. The team gave a brief, itadakimas, and began to dig into their steak dishes. Sakura especially seemed to be digging into hers with gusto, suggesting she didn't get to enjoy meals like this often. Slow down Pinky. The steak's not gonna run off on ya. Anko spoke, trying to get the Haruno to slow down a bit, which seemed to work as the pink-haired Kunoichi gave a sheepish expression then slowed down her pace and started cutting her steak into smaller pieces to avoid the possibility of choking. It was at this point that they took notice of someone approaching their table, and it wasn't a waitress. It was one Hanada Hayuga, her face pale and she was currently panting for air, her disheveled appearance making it look like she had just run a marathon, Sakura-san. I've been looking everywhere for you. The Hayuga heiress managed to wheeze out, her legs wobbling under her, making it appear she could collapse at any moment. Naruto smoothly slid out of his seat and swept up Hanada in a bridal carry so she wouldn't fall down. Whoa now. Take a second. We don't need you passing out on us. The whiskered teen spoke in a concerned voice as Hanada blushed profusely from the close contact with her crush and gave a nod as she tried to catch her breath. What's all the fuss Hanada-san? Sakura asked with a raised eyebrow. It seemed kind of odd that the Hyuga girl was seeking her out like this. They hadn't ever spoken much at the academy so they weren't exactly friends or anything. Did something happen? Sakura-san, there's no easy way for me to explain but, Hinata spoke and then paused as she pursed her lips for a moment and then continued to speak, but your father, he is dead. Once those words were spoken, all eyes turned towards Sakura, waiting to see how she would react, though a certain pair of pariahs had a small idea. The pinkette smiled coldly and snickered as she spoke in a bone-chilling voice, it's about damn time. Most everyone present felt their hearts drop into their pelvis, or felt a strong urge to relieve themselves because of how nonchalantly the pinkette took the news of Kazashi's death. Hell, she was now chewing some of her steak as if there was nothing wrong at all. Um, Sakura. Didn't you hear what Hanada said? She said your dad is dead. Kakashi asked since he had never ever seen someone take the news of a family member in such a manner. And why should I care? He was an abusive bastard. The pinkette spoke with a grimace, which was quickly replaced with a sinister smile. Oh, and by the way Sasuke-kun. I never really liked you and I think you're an asshole. The Haruno added since her father was now unable to do her harm for anything she said or did that could jeopardize her relationship with the Uchiha. That part of her life was dead and gone as far as she was concerned. So, how did he die? I'd really like to know. Did he die in agony like a squealing piggy? The Haruno asked, showing off a darker part of herself that she had long repressed for so many years, and in the background, Anko was liking this new side of the pinkette. It kinda reminded her of herself. Erm, he was attacked. By dolls. They stabbed him to death. He looked like he was in a lot of pain before he died. Hanada surmised, the scene she described still burned into her mind since that was the first time she had seen a man killed in such a brutal manner. Sakura hummed in thought as she raised an eyebrow and glanced over to Naruto. The whiskered teen having an all too innocent expression as he winked at her flirtatiously. As far as she was aware, he was the only person that caught on to the fact she was being abused, however there was no way for him to have done the deed during their test, unless he had some kind of connection to the aforementioned dolls. She decided not to ask him about it quite yet since she didn't want to implicate him. Well, this turned out to be an interesting day. Should we reschedule our meetup or anything, Sakura? Kakashi asked politely, earning a quick shake of the head from the Haruno. Nah. No need for that. I'm all set and good to go. She spoke excitedly, earning a small sigh from the copy ninja. He supposed that if she didn't need time to grieve for an abusive father, then it may be better to put her energy to more productive pursuits. Um, Naruto. You can put Hanada back down now. Anko spoke, gesturing towards her favorite blonde who was still carrying the heiress. The Jinchuriki merely chuckled and replied to her, she hasn't asked me to do so. Are you jealous that you're not being carried like a princess or something hubbyheim? 
The dango lover playfully flipped him off since he wasn't wrong. While Hinata simply shrugged her shoulders as she enjoyed the contact with her crush. But she still couldn't stay since she needed to report back to her sensei and let her know everything was alright. Naruto-kun? Can you please let me go? I need to meet back with Kuranai sensei As you wish Hina-chan. Say hi to Nai-chan for me. The Uzumaki answered and gently released the heiress, allowing her to leave. Hinata bid everyone goodbye and then left. Once she was gone, the blonde Uzumaki asked anyone up for dessert, and then proudly held up the Uchiha's wallet. Stop mooching off of me you bastards! Sasuke shouted as he tried to snatch back his wallet, earning some chuckles from the rest of Team 7. The atmosphere becoming somewhat jovial again as they tried to move past the little scene they had just experienced. Kakashi and Anko shared a look and nodded to each other as they silently agreed that it would be interesting to see how this rendition of Team 7 would turn out. Once their dinner came to a close and the bill was paid, they all decided to head their separate ways for the night. The Uchiha was the first to get up and leave after finally retrieving his wallet back and left grumbling angrily to himself. The rest of the team chuckled at his expense, knowing full well that he wasn't lacking in money to burn. Naruto glanced over to his dear friend Anko and mouthed a quick, I'll see you later. Earning a nod of understanding from the Dango lover who gave a two-fingered salute and left so she could go home and chill for a while before tomorrow came. He then turned towards Sakura and asked, Hey Sakura, would you like me to walk you home? The Haruno gave a thoughtful expression for a moment then smiled warmly and nodded since she appreciated the company, not to mention it would give an excuse to be alone with him and talk privately. The two genin then left together leaving Kakashi to be the last one at the table who decided to take this chance to read a few pages from his favorite little orange book. Outside, both Naruto and Sakura walked together in a comfortable silence, any hostilities from their past having melted away. Though the silence didn't last for long as Sakura suddenly spun around, grabbed the blonde by his collar and roughly pulled him into a dark alleyway out of sight from the street and any potential passerbys. Whoa now Sakura-chan. If you want to have your way with me, there's a thing called love hotels, unless doing it outside or in public is your thing. The Uzumaki spoke teasingly, earning a small punch to his chest from the pinkette who chuckled at his joke. Hardy har har, baka. Now tell me the truth, it was you, wasn't it? She spoke in an accusatory tone, as though she were conducting an interrogation. Me? What did I do? I don't know what you're talking about. The whiskered teen spoke with a broad grin the thinly veiled sarcasm earning a scoff from the pinkette. Oh, no don't give me that shit. I'm not a gullible fangirl, I never was. You were the first and only person to realize what I was going through, and now the old man is dead. Heck of a coincidence, wouldn't you think? She spoke with a dark chuckle. Is it? Who knows? Let's entertain the idea and say, and this is not an admission, that I did kill Kazashi Haruno. What are you gonna do about it? The blonde asked coolly a coy grin on his face as his words earned an amused giggle from the pinkette. That depends. If you weren't involved, I'll just say it was my mistake and move on. Though if you did kill that bastard, then I would work hard to repay you for it. You want to use me as a sex toy? I'll lift my skirt up for you anytime, anywhere. You want to gather a few friends and gangbang me? I'll do it all with a big grin on my face as I take your loads. You want to use me as a broodmare? I'll pump out as many kids as my body can handle. She spoke in a serious tone, giving off a cocky grin as she released the blonde from her grip then straightened his clothes for him. Enticing offer. I could lie and take advantage of you. Naruto spoke the last part in a snarky voice, his words earning some laughter from the pinkette. Don't insult my intelligence Naruto Baka. We both hid behind masks for years, and what's that old saying? You can't bullshit a bullshitter because I know for a fact you aren't the kind of guy to ever take advantage of a girl. She responded in a confident tone, earning a tip of the hat from the blonde since she had hit the nail on the head. Believe whatever you want to believe then Sakura-chan. The whiskered teen spoke with a charming smile, and then gave a small wink. Even if he didn't say it out loud, she knew for sure that he was the one responsible for her salvation. Now she and her mother were finally free of a monster. Sure. I'll do just that. I look forward to serving you and your needs in the future. She spoke with a saucy grin and then cupped his crotch in her soft hands. Now if you'll be excusing me, I gotta start packing on a few pounds if I ever want to fill out and fix this stick figure of mine. She spoke and then gestured towards her flat chest and butt which didn't show off any curves. 
With that said, she excused herself and began to walk the rest of the way home on her own, leaving Naruto behind to watch her form leave, and when she had vanished from sight, the young witch doctor decided it would be a good idea to check in on his apartment and see how his proxies were doing. A short while later, heave ho, heave ho, came the collective chants of the steadily growing army of dolls as they continued their construction project for their masters and their boss. One particular doll, dressed in a black robe seemed to be overseeing the work that was done. Walk faster. Fo de basu. The black robed doll shouted earning a collective chant of Fo de basu from the numerous proxies as they quickly doubled their efforts which satisfied their apparent foreman as the dolls worked tirelessly with an almost fanatic zeal. Unlike human workers, the proxies had no need for food or sleep. While they were small in stature, their ever-growing numbers made up for it. Kukaku shouted a random proxy as it approached the black-robed one, which answered to the name, Cupcake. The black-robed doll in question turned towards its comrade, identifying it as a lookout and gibbered as if to ask what it wanted. Dabasu. The doll shouted and pointed towards the door, and as if on cue, the door gently swung open revealing the form of Naruto Uzumaki himself. Their beloved boss. Good evening my friends. Working hard or hardly working? The whiskered teen asked with a chuckle, earning some giggles from the dolls. A few of them dropped what they were doing and began to crowd around his legs, hugging whatever part of him they could grab with their tiny little arms. I heard about what you did to Kazashi. Excellent work my friends. The blonde congratulated them with a smile, earning some cheers from the proxies that whooped and hollered in joy for the praise. But our work is far from done. There's still plenty of other scumbags that need to be taken care of, and I'll be needing your assistance again in the not so distant future so expect me to use your services a lot. Until then, keep up the good work. When the blonde was finished speaking, more cheers erupted from the dolls as they clapped in appreciation for the Uzumaki's words and were looking forward to more jobs in the future. Naruto smirked and carefully stepped over the dolls to avoid trampling over them as they resumed their construction project of his old apartment. Oheo oh Cupcake. Progress report? The blonde asked as he tipped his hat towards the little black robed doll. Cupcake nodded and began to speak in what seemed to be gibberish, but the blonde nodded his head along as though he understood perfectly what the proxy was saying which he actually did. Yeesh. Mold and stuff. Wood rot. I'm amazed that this place is still standing or hasn't gone up in flames or something. The blonde muttered as he glanced over at a group of dolls that were using some kind of device that looked like a cross between a lifting platform and battering ram armed with a sledgehammer to bust down the walls. He had to admit, those dolls were pretty creative when it came to finding ways of making up for their small size. Naruto then took notice that one particular doll seemed to be missing. Where's the Sakura doll? He asked with a raised eyebrow, prompting Cupcake to give his report on the subject. Ah. So she chose to stay behind and keep an eye on things in the Haruno household eh? Makes sense I guess. Who knows? Sakura may need a guardian angel's intervention in the future. Naruto muttered as he tipped his hat, earning some squeaky giggles from the proxies a few of them recalling stabbing the noisy pink-haired man to death. That was more fun than killing the whiny silver-haired man. Naruto then smirked to himself a bit as he leaned against his cane, feeling rather triumphant with his success. Still, he'd have to be a bit more careful in the future on account of the fact that Sakura correctly connected the dots. So of course there may be others that could figure it out just as well. It would probably be for the best to wait things out for a while. Now that he was on a team, he would be able to focus more on his shinobi training while in his free time, he can continue studying the arts of magic and voodoo from the Loa. For now, he would wait and see how things play out. He pulled out his deck of tarot cards and pulled one out to get a read on what to expect tomorrow, and it seemed as though the cards said that tomorrow he would form a connection and lifelong friendship with somebody. The whiskered teen grinned a bit to himself and felt a sense of confidence that tomorrow would be interesting to say the least. Now then, with his brief survey done here, it was time to head back to Anko's place for a good night's sleep. I'll be back tomorrow. Keep up the good work my little friends. Naruto spoke with a tip of the hat and then departed, leaving his little assistants to continue their work. Fo de basu. Cupcake shouted, urging all the others on as they parroted the phrase in unison as they continued shattering and breaking down the walls. Their eagerness to please the Loa and Naruto shone as they worked with an almost fanatical zeal. They hoped that their patrons would like the place when it was finished. The next morning. In the mission assignment office, Hiruzen Serutobi can be seen sitting behind his desk, 
smoking from his favored pipe as he oversaw the assignment of various missions to teams that were best suited for the chosen team. He then glanced over at his new assistant and asked, How many more teams do we have to assign missions to? His new assistant was none other than Tsubaki, the late Mizuki's girlfriend who now had a seal planted on the back of her neck to ensure her obedience and to keep her from escaping. She was currently serving her time in indentured servitude and community service until the time came for her chance at parole. While she wasn't directly involved in Mizuki's plot, the withholding of crucial information involving the theft still counted as a serious crime, hence her current station. Just Team 7 Hokage-sama. They should be due to arrive any minute now, assuming Kakashi-san is on time. She murmured out at the end, earning a soft snort from the Sandame since that was true. And he had to admit, Tsubaki had taken to her position rather well. If she continued to be cooperative, it was possible she may get parole early for good behavior. His brief musing was interrupted when the form of Team 7 entered inside. Morning old man. You seem to be in a good mood today. Ah, and it's Tsubaki-san too. Naruto spoke as he tipped his hat to her. The Chunin girl pursed her lips, remembering that he had drugged and kidnapped her, but she didn't hold any grudges against him since he had actually done the village a service, one that she didn't do herself. Hiruzen chuckled at the blonde boy's words and replied, Indeed. And I see you know Tsubaki-san as well. She has been very helpful with paperwork and whatnot. She keeps a good filing system going. His words earned a few chuckles from the Jonin since filing paperwork and mission reports could indeed be a hassle. Enough with the niceties. We're here for a mission. Sasuke spoke impatiently, earning a few scowls from everyone present. Still, he wasn't wrong either, but he could definitely do with some lessons in manners. Hiruzen ignored the Uchiha's rudeness this time and spoke, naturally. Speaking of which, I have a special mission for Team 7. The Sandame announced, earning some raised eyebrows from the newly minted team. Special mission. Who's the client and what are we supposed to do? Sakura asked, hoping to get more details. The Hokage gave an amused smile as he replied, You're looking at the client now. A. Eh? You Gigi. Well now, this mission might be interesting. Naruto spoke excitedly while the two Jonin listened quietly. Just what kind of mission was their team going to get right out of the gates? Just yesterday, this was left taped to the front door of my private residence. The Hokage spoke as he produced an envelope from his robes and placed it on his desk, allowing for the newly minted team to approach and pull out the note inside. The forbidden scroll will be mine. Don't try to stop me. Was what was written on the paper, except there were two things that Naruto couldn't help but point out. Okay, this note would appear a bit more threatening if it wasn't written in crayon, and it's not the smartest move to announce your crime before you attempt it. The Uzumaki's words earning nods of agreement from everyone present. The writing is pretty crude too. Like a kid wrote this, as evidenced by the crayon. Sakura pointed out as she scratched her head leading her to continue speaking, so is this a prank or something then? The Sandame rubbed his temples as he spoke, I believe so, and if the thief is who I suspect it to be, you shouldn't have much trouble. Hence why this is classified as a D rank for the time being and why I don't want to waste my ambu on such matters. That aside, I also believe that this team can do something that I myself wouldn't be able to with the thief in question. The Hokage spoke in a cryptic manner, his eyes locked on Naruto's form earning a raised eyebrow from the boy. A prank eh? Well if that's the case then I guess me and Anko aren't needed to. The copy ninja spoke only to earn an elbow in the ribs courtesy of the snake mistress. Don't use this as an excuse to slack off to read your porn. We still gotta observe the team and shit. Anko growled out, refusing the copy ninja the chance to slack off earning a sheepish chuckle from the masked man. Oh fine. And it's not porn, it's art. Kakashi retorted, however his response earned a dark look from the snake mistress as she mumbled quietly, anything written by that fucking perv doesn't deserve to be called art. Well then team 7. It is time for you to go to work. The Forbidden Scroll has been moved to my private residence on a temporary basis until a new and more secure location has been built to store it. I wish you all the best of luck. Hiruzen spoke earning a series of nods, although a certain Uchiha muttered something about this being beneath him though no one seemed to be paying him any attention. With their mission parameters given to them, it was time to go perform their duty for the day. Later. Am I just eating because I'm bored? Asked the form of Sakura as she picked at a slice of strawberry cheesecake that she had been saving in a storage seal for a snack. 
deciding to take a page from Naruto's book and use said seals to keep snacks and food on hand in case she ever needed them. She wasn't going to go hungry like she almost did during their test. She then glanced over towards the window and saw a trio of cats happily playing just outside which made for an adorable sight. Careful Sakura. Eat too many sweets and you run the risk of getting fat. Same to you Anko-chan. Naruto spoke in a warning tone to the Kunoichi, the snake mistress in question shivering in horror and disgust as she pictured an older and fatter out of shape version of her, she'd have to cut back on her daily dango and red bean soup intake, severely. Sasuke for his part was staring at a large glass case display that contained a large scroll, which he assumed to be the forbidden scroll. HN. This doesn't make sense to me. Why keep something like that tucked away when all the techniques inside could be put to use? Kakashi glanced up from his little orange book and guessed that the Uchiha mainly said that because he wanted to use the techniques for his own purposes and then spoke, while I can't say that I totally disagree with you, there are a number of techniques in that scroll that are far too dangerous to use. Many of which potential enemies could wish to steal, either from the scroll itself or from those who learned said techniques. The Uchiha snorted in annoyance as he continued to leer at the scroll. Naruto for his part rolled his eyes and guessed that the scroll on display was little more than a dummy. A fake to mislead potential thieves while the real one was hidden somewhere in or around the Hokage's home, though he wasn't gonna tell the Uchiha that. Hey Sakura. How's your mom doing? The Uzumaki asked out of concern, causing the Pinkette to give him a warm smile at his concern. After taking another bite of her cheesecake she replied, she's alright. A little shaken up, she still thinks this is all a dream and when she wakes up she'll find herself under his thumb again. She's going to get some therapy for the abuse she suffered. Otherwise, I think she's going to be okay. Naruto was glad to hear that and hoped that the Haruno family could put everything that happened behind them. Sakura then snapped her fingers and said, I almost forgot. This was left for me too. The Pinkette then pulled out a small doll made in her likeness. Isn't it cute? She spoke as she presented it to her team. Naruto and Anko already knew of its existence and nodded in agreement. Sasuke of course ignored the Haruno. But Kakashi raised an eyebrow and had to admit that while he didn't know anything about dolls, this one was made with a lot of care and attention to detail. Wait. Didn't Hanada mention something about Kazashi being attacked by dolls or something? The Sakura doll seemed harmless enough, but for some reason he felt a sense of unease. He felt almost as if those little button eyes were watching everything. Kinda creepy really. I decided to take this little thing with me as a good luck charm. Sakura spoke, hugging the doll to her chest as she gave a flirty wink towards Naruto, since she had guessed that the doll was from him. Before their little conversation could continue further, the lights cut out leaving the team in pitch black darkness. The sounds of little feet rushed past them, then there was the sound of glass shattering. Naruto remembered the location of the light switched and thrust his cane towards it to flip the lights back on, which revealed the form of a small boy with a long blue scarf holding the scroll they were meant to protect. Who the hell is this little brat? Sasuke asked with a small growl. The two Jonin shook their heads and sighed since they knew who the thief in question was just from one glance. Should have figured it'd be this kid. He's the Sandame's grandson, Konohamaru. Anko spoke as she stood up and stuffed her hands in her coat pockets. Wait, what? Why would the Hokage's grandson want to steal the Forbidden Scroll? Sakura asked with a raised eyebrow which earned a snort from the scarf-wearing boy. Wouldn't you like to know? Doesn't matter since I'll be the Hokage after I learn a jutsu from this here scroll. Konohamaru announced with a chuckle as he quickly reached into his pocket for something. As he did so, Naruto couldn't help but notice that the boy's scarf appeared to be snagged to the display, likely when he threw off the glass case to get the fake scroll. The blonde could warn him about it, but figured that it wouldn't be fun to spoil the surprise. The Sandame's grandson threw a smoke bomb causing it to explode into a large grey cloud to help cover his escape. He tried to use the momentary diversion to escape and slip past Team 7, only for a choked gasp to come out followed by a thump. The smoke quickly dispersed revealing that his scarf did indeed get snagged, and it had tightened around his little neck when he attempted to run off. Naruto stood over him and spoke, not a good idea to wear a scarf that long. It could easily get caught on something. Or, a potential enemy could use it against you and strangle you to death with it. The Uzumaki then used the blade hidden in his cane to slice off a large portion of the unnecessarily long scarf, freeing the boy as he gasped and wheezed for air. When the boy got his second wind, 
He pointed an accusatory finger at the Uzumaki and shouted, You! You tripped me up and choked me! Didn't you? At the boy's accusation, the Uzumaki in question gave a casual shrug. I didn't do anything. A scarf that long can easily get caught or grabbed by something as I previously mentioned. It's actually a bit of a wonder it hasn't already done you in. Naruto spoke with a slightly sadistic chuckle, the rest of his team silently agreeing with him as Konohamaru pouted. All right now. Come on. Spill it. Why try and steal the scroll? Naruto spoke impatiently. The only response he received was the Serutobi boy sticking his tongue out mockingly. The kid was certainly stubborn. Had to give him that. Gonna be all obstinate, eh? That's all right. I'm certain the cards can tell me what I need to know. Naruto spoke as he pulled out his deck of tarot cards. Please. You really think parlor tricks are gonna work, Dobi? The Uchiha muttered as he rolled his eyes, believing things like fortune telling and tarot cards to nothing but cheap tricks. The Jinchuriki ignored him and pulled out the first card and began to speak, Interesting. You have been living in the shadow of your grandpa for some years now, and people only see you as just that, the Sandame's grandkids. They always suck up to you because they have to, and you can get away with virtually anything, but what you really want is genuine acknowledgement and respect. You believe that by becoming Hokage that you'll gain the recognition you desire. That about cover it? Once Naruto had finished speaking, the Serutobi boy's eyes seemed to light up almost instantly, holy cow! You got all that just from looking at a card? Is there some kind of special trick? The scarf-wearing kid asked in awe, earning a few chuckles from the blonde. To properly read the tarot cards takes a certain degree of training, and the right connections to the spirits. This was a fairly straightforward and simple reading. Plus, I also know how it feels to be alone. Now answer me this, do you sincerely believe that anyone will respect a, Hokage, that took the mantle by cheating or using dishonest methods? Would anyone respect a cage that hasn't earned the title through their own hard work and earned merits? Naruto asked at the end, earning a small frown from Konohamaru who had to admit, that the whiskered genin made a solid point. I know all that but, it all seems like such a long way, and I want to be Hokage right now. Konohamaru mumbled in a slightly depressed manner. Yeah, it is. But you can't go around taking easy shortcuts to get what you want. Want a piece of advice? What you want isn't always what you need. You want to be Hokage, but what you really need is to find and make friends that will appreciate you for being you. And if you do that, I think you'll find things to be much easier and better. After all, a special someone helped me out a lot over the years. Naruto spoke and then flashed a smile in the direction of a certain Dango lover who smiled back warmly. Is it really that simple? The young Serutobi asked hopefully, earning a nod from the whiskered teen. Naruto crouched down to meet Konohamaru at eye level and replied to him, Trust me, I wouldn't lie about that kind of thing. Just give it a try. And if you ever need a hand, I'll be there to help you out. Konohamaru was silent for a few moments and then nodded in acceptance as he muttered, I guess it's worth a shot. I'm sorry for all the trouble I caused. The Serutobi apologized prompting the others to nod in acceptance since it seemed he had learned his lesson. Don't worry about it. Everyone makes mistakes from time to time, what matters is if we learn from them. Anyway, go find some friends and be sure to train hard if you're serious about being Hokage. I look forward to sparring with you when you get stronger. Naruto spoke as he tipped his hat. In response, the scarf-wearing boy grinned and gave a quick salute before running off, most likely to go find potential friends. Once he was gone, a telephone began ringing, alerting Team 7 who all raised curious eyebrows. Should somebody answer that? Anko asked as she tilted her head, at her question, Naruto shrugged and volunteered himself as he picked up the phone and muttered a quick, hello, into the mouthpiece. Ah. Naruto-kun. Job well done to you and Team 7. Spoke the familiar voice of the Sandame who sounded like he was in a very good mood. Old man. You were watching through that crystal ball the whole time weren't you? Naruto asked or rather stated with a sly grin, his question, prompting some chuckles from the Hokage. Indeed Naruto-kun. I apologize for not giving you the full details of this mission and for having to get involved in a family affair, but I was confident that you'd be able to handle it and set Konohamaru straight. Kami knows I've tried myself, but he wouldn't listen to me. At any rate, there's another reason I'm calling. It would appear that two subjects of another mission are in your general area. If you can capture them, it would be a tremendous help. The Hokage spoke, prompting the Uzumaki to ask for more details about the subjects. Well, 
The previous Torah has recently passed away so the daimyo's wife was about to pick a new Torah to replace the previous. She had it narrowed to three potential candidates, but they all escaped before she could make her final choice. If you and Team 7 could recapture them, I would be very grateful. The Hokage explained, and then the sounds of a woman sobbing loudly in the background could be heard as Hiruzen muttered, please help me. With that, Naruto decided to hang up and reported what the Sandame had said over the phone, earning some collective groans since they were all aware of the infamous Torah. Great, so we have to chase down three of them. Did the Hokage explain what they looked like? Anko asked in mild annoyance, her question being answered as a nearby machine began beeping which gained their attention and some photographs were printed out revealing three different cats. One was black and appeared to be wearing a witch's hat, another was also black and had a mischievous looking aura about it, and the last one had flax covered fur and had a playful demeanor. Huh, they look like the ones just outside. Kakashi pointed out as he gestured to a trio of cats that were busy sunbathing outside and then, they all froze up and glanced between the pictures of the felines a few times and realized, they were outside the whole time. The team shouted in unison. After taking a few seconds to calm themselves Naruto spoke, wow. What are the odds? Anyways, let's see if we can snag them before they wander off. Let's be careful, if these guys are as crafty as the previous Tauras, we don't want them to run away. One by itself is bad enough. Kakashi muttered as he remembered the time he and his team chased Tora the Fourth. Those claws were perhaps one of the worst forms of physical pain he'd ever encountered after he had to pry the feline off of Obito's face, and those sharp little teeth. The Jinchuriki smirked as he summed a bento full of salmon to entice the cat's appetites. Hopefully a little bribe would earn their trust. I think I should go out alone, that way they won't feel so threatened. The rest of you should circle around in case they do try to run. Naruto spoke, prompting the team to mutter their agreements, even Sasuke though he believed this was all a waste of his time. The blonde boy gently tiptoed his way outside and sat a respectful distance away from the cats to avoid spooking them. They quickly took notice of his presence and eyed him curiously, hey there. You critters hungry? He spoke to them gently and then popped the bento open and offered the bits of fish to them. This seemed to do the trick as the felines padded up to him, meowing excitedly as they accepted the food from him. Surprisingly, each one patiently took a turn as they gently took their respective pieces from his fingers. After their little snack, the cats began to rub their bodies against Naruto's as they happily purred showing that they felt comfortable in his presence. It seemed like they had taken to him rather quickly thanks to his little bribe. After a few moments, the others emerged from their hiding places since it seemed the cats weren't going to bolt on them. Wow. They took a fast liking to you. Anko commented with a small grin, though she wasn't totally surprised since he could befriend almost anyone if he tried. A. Hey. Animals always like me. Naruto replied with a shrug, for some reason, he had a strong feeling about these cats for some reason, he could tell that they were far from ordinary. Deciding to take a peek into their future, the whiskered teen pulled out a random tarot card from his deck, and found that good fortune was on the horizon. It seems that both the Loa and Lady Luck were now favoring him. A short while later. Hokage office. Team 7 arrived rather quickly to turn in the needed reports, and were greeted by the pained yowls of another cat that was currently trapped in the embrace of a woman that is, rather on the large side if anyone was being honest. Everyone couldn't help but cringe, excluding Sasuke at the cat's pain while the woman in question seemed to be squeezing it a bit too tightly. At his desk, Hiruzen turned towards the team and spoke, Ah, Team 7. I apologize for this, but apparently another Torah has already been chosen before you arrived. I'm sorry for sending you on a goose chase. Eh. No big deal. Didn't take much to catch these guys. Naruto spoke as he looked down at the trio of felines in his arms, all of which gave sympathetic looks to the new Torah that was screeching out. If Naruto had to guess, it was probably screaming for a mercy killing. Poor thing. Excuse me ma'am, but I think you might be hurting your cat. Naruto spoke in a polite manner, and most everyone in the room, excluding Sasuke, looked at him as though he were insane. Did the idiot realize who he was talking to? This was the daimyo's wife for crying out loud. Eh? What's that you said young man? She asked as she turned to the blonde boy in question and then took note of the cats in his arms. Oh my. A fellow cat lover. How nice to meet you. She continued to speak in a friendly manner as she admired the cats he was holding. I like all kinds of animals, and likewise ma'am. As I was saying, I can see you want to give your cat lots of love and affection, 
but I think you're being rather rough on the poor critter. The Jinchuriki explained patiently, with both of his senseis making cutting motions across their throats to send a signal for him to shut up. There was a pregnant pause for a few long moments as the daimyo's wife cast a few glances between the new, Tora, and the Uzumaki, the former crying anime tears as its soul seemed to be leaking from its mouth. Is that so? She asked prompting the blonde to nod as he set down two of his charges and gently carried the one with flax-colored fur and then showed her how to properly hold a cat without causing it discomfort and to gently pet it. After a few moments of instruction, the daimyo's wife caught on rather quickly as her more gentle touch seemed to quickly soothe and relax the new, Tora, the feline's eyes now shedding tears of relief and happiness that its suffering was over. Thank you ever so much young man. What is your name? She asked with a warm smile. Naruto Uzumaki. Genin of Konoha, member of Team 7, lover of the fairer sex, and part-time professional asshole. The blonde spoke as he introduced himself with the sandame and the others staring at him with wide eyes, minus the Uchiha. Oh really? Erm. What's a professional asshole? Do exactly? The daimyo's wife asked since she had never heard of the term before. Oh, it basically means that I make it my job to mess with people I don't like, mainly arrogant dipshits. The whiskered teen replied while casting a glance towards the self-proclaimed, elite. The daimyo's wife merely giggled as she responded, that sounds like an interesting job. I wish you luck young Naruto. I'll be sending you a generous bonus for showing me some tips about handling a cat. With that said, she departed with a relaxed and happy Tora. Once she was gone Anko was the first to pounce on Naruto and started shaking him about like a ragdoll. Are you insane you little shit? That was the fucking daimyo's fucking wife. She screeched out at almost the same volume of Sakura's infamous screeches during her time as a fangirl. Yeah. So what? She didn't seem like a bad person. Just overzealous. Naruto spoke out when he slipped out of Anko's grip, since he felt like he was about to get a major case of whiplash. Don't ever do anything stupid like that again. Anko warned him with a small snarl, which seemed to send a clear message as the blonde tipped his hat to her and in the background Sakura wondered how his hat didn't fall off when their sensei was shaking him about. So, what happens to these guys then? Kakashi asked as he pointed towards the cats that were currently surrounding Naruto and rubbing their bodies against his legs, although the one he was holding seemed to have swirls in its eyes as it meowed weakly. Hey old man. Mind if I keep these cats? The Uzumaki asked, earning a dismissive shrug from the Sandame who replied back, I suppose it's fine since they'll be needing a good home. Appreciate it. I'll see about getting them food, bowls, collars and stuff later. Now I just need to name them. The blonde muttered to himself as he scooped up the other cats in his arms. The one wearing the witch's hat giggled as it spoke in a female voice, My name's Blair Sama. This is Yoruichi and Felix Chan. You can talk? Shouted almost everyone in the room shouted with the exclusion of Naruto. Of course we can talk. Are talking cats really that strange? Asked the one called Yoruichi in a snarky tone as her compatriots giggled in amusement. I thought that there was something funny about you three. I sensed it almost immediately after we left, but couldn't put my finger on it. You guys are familiars. Naruto commented with a smirk as the felines purred and rubbed their heads against him. You got it. Wait till you see what we look like in our human forms. Spoke the form of Felix with a giggle and a purr, giving the Uzumaki a sly wink. A familiar? Is that some kind of special summon? Sasuke asked with a raised eyebrow, wondering if it meant that they could be potentially powerful tools if he found one of his own. After all, it should be noted that a number of big name shinobi have summons. Like the Sanin or Hanzo the Salamander as examples. Not quite. Familiars are special animals that a ninja forms a close bond with, almost symbiotic in nature and work in tandem with their partners. Much like the Inazuka's canine partners or the Abarame's insects. Kakashi explained as he crossed his arms. He hadn't sensed anything about the cats earlier, but then it was strongly possible that they were just really good at hiding their true nature. HN. I see. Still, I doubt that those flea bitten cats will do you any good, Dobi. Sasuke muttered arrogantly since he didn't see how they could be useful for a shinobi. The Uzumaki clicked his tongue and shook his head as he replied, goes to show what you know Sasuke. In the shinobi world, you can't solve all of your problems with brute force. The blonde was certain that these cats would prove very useful to him in the future, and make great company as well. With that said and done, 
Team 7 departed to their respective homes, with Naruto tagging along with Anko since his apartment was still being renovated. He would also need to see about making certain arrangements to find potential souls to feed to the Loa. After all, they could only be patient for so long before they hungered for more. The end. Remember to subscribe and like this video. See you in the next video.